the committee is in public session and ask members if they're aware of any apologies. I think we have full attendance, Clark, so we'll move on to chairperson's business. Can I uh, remind members that the Department of Education has launched a Safer Schools app, uh, which has been uh, produced uh, by Unique Safeguarding Group and is designed to provide support to parents and carers and children uh, for online safety. And the app is now available. Uh, can I remind members also that the executive's coronavirus recovery plan um, is proposing the use of blended learning at all stages of educational recovery. And Stranmills College is currently providing uh, a course for um, remote learning for teachers. Uh, and online safety and uh, cyber bullying is obviously an uh, extremely important issue. So could I suggest to members uh, that we ask uh, the teaching unions today about uh, the progress of remote learning, any concerns in that regard, and that the committee also invite Noel Purdy uh, and relevant staff from Strand Millis to brief the committee on the work they're doing in this regard. Agreed? Okay, thank you. Um, okay, agenda item 2.2 members is post-primary transfer. Can I refer members to tabled items, which includes an email from uh, an, an MLA setting out concerns relating to the proposed two-week delay to the uh, staging of uh, non-statutory post-primary transfer tests in 2020. The correspondence suggests that the committee consider uh, this matter um, uh, in relation to post-primary transfer process. Can I, I suggest members again that we consider this suggestion. Um, we use the opportunity to raise it with the teacher unions today if they, have, if they don't already do so. Um, and after uh, today's Department of Education update, we can decide how we respond to that uh, correspondence in relation to the, the length of delay and any alternatives to the uh, usual post-primary transfer process. Um, I will, um, sorry, just a moment. Um, Clark, I would like to propose that we write to all selective schools to ask what contingency plans <coughs> are in place should it not be possible to use the uh, AQE and PPTC set tests for post-primary admissions criteria in 2021 as well. Um, are members agreed with that approach? Yeah, yeah. who's that? Robbie. Yeah, Robbie, go ahead. I think that's, that's a good idea, but I think in terms of the, the letter that it would be sent to them, sure, um, would need to be contained all of the, the salient questions and asks of the committee as opposed to a single point on, on that. That is a good and relevant point, but I think we need to go through the staged approach to this. Um, and that what can be achieved this year, and then and that's obviously the fallback there um, with regard to in the instance where it doesn't happen, whether that's due to COVID and the second outbreak or whether it's down to a lack of agreement. But I do agree with you, but I think it needs to form part of the wider committee's ask uh, to the sector. That's great. What, what, other, what, what specific questions would you like us to include in that, Robbie? So, so with regard to, I think at the moment for me, the, the AQE delay is probably the, the, the biggest topic having but the sub teachers haven't been paid uh, or will be paid out shortly so i think this is a this is the single most important issue that we need to be focused on um we're not too sure what uh, communications have been made between the, the teaching unions uh between the parent rep body the minister ea and the um pptc and aqe so i think we need to see some transparency on it see what discussions have went forward so far and to see what options are on the table specifically with the delay I'm sure but I think we would be doing a disservice to our P6 children regardless of the politics of whether the transfer test is appropriate or not is that these children have been preparing for it for six years most of them um, and probably the fairest outcome undoubtedly this year will be that there is a further delay to it and every child gets the opportunity to pre prepare for it properly uh, and then and in the instance then where that's not achievable, then obviously there's the fallback options as you've alluded to. But I think we need to get the views of all of the, the sector here and see what communications have, had, have taken place up to this stage. We've seen great agility and innovation in and around GCSEs and, and A-levels and so on. So I think we need to see that here at the transfer test. 
Okay. I think I got a question in there, and just to be clear, my my question is a fairly open ended one that I'm proposing in terms of asking what contingencies are in place. Should it not be possible to set the tests? I'm not I'm I'm not expressing a, a view in that question in any shape or form. Um, and I think your question is some is is particularly around the delay. So um, oh, yeah. what what so yeah. I think it's in terms of those, if there's a number of stage questions, it's, um, it is trying to seek the best outcome, make it people centred at this stage, but there's nothing wrong with your question, sir. It's just making sure that there's not multiple communications going about the same topic. Yeah, no, that's fair. So we, um, if, if we include in, in correspondence some, some reference to the work that has been done to date to yeah. arrive at the two weeks and to ask what other work could be done to try and increase that delay? Is that what you're suggesting, Robbie? Uh, absolutely. And I think yeah. we need to scope out what the Minister pointed out, which is probably a, a sort of a resource and logistical issue as to the time frames. I'm, I'm sure they're not insurmountable in terms of marking papers and, 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 and that school allocation and stuff on the other side. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's pretty much it, sir. Okay. Members agreed? Chair. Oh, yeah, Clark. I'd, I'd, um, so, yeah, we, the committee could write to the um, selective schools in those terms. Um, uh, members may be aware the Committee for the Economy has just launched a um, survey, essentially, of what it is. It's actually about the energy strategy, and it's all online. Um, you could do something similar, or maybe at this stage you just want to write to the selective schools and maybe we could return to that at, uh, when we have those answers. Yeah, no, I, I had, had noted... Um, the economy committee survey into the energy strategy. Um, uh, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps Clark could um, next week brief us on the nature of that approach to the economy committee survey on the energy strategy, which is a I think an extremely short, um, concise terms of reference. Um, and after today's evidence, perhaps a committee and and on receipt of that briefing of that the nature of that approach could consider whether the committee does a very short, concise um, survey into post-primary transfer 2021, but i um, happy to, to return to that. Uh, members, can I also suggest then that we um, ask Assembly Research to produce a short paper summarising the, the different English and maths um, uh, assessments that take place in primary school already at this stage are, are members content with those proposals? Agreed? Yep. Agreed. Yes. Agreed? Agreed. Okay, thank Agreed. you. Uh, okay, members, can I draft minutes uh, are of May the 13th, 2020, or at page 6? Can I seek members' agreements to the draft uh, minutes? Agreed? Agreed. Okay, Agreed. thank you. Thank you. Uh, the matters arising, do members have any matters arising? No. Nope. Okay then, members, agenda item five is the coronavirus and impact on schools oral briefing from the Northern Ireland Teacher Council. Can I refer members to a briefing paper from the committee clerk at page 13, a paper on options for reopening schools from the NEU at page 20, a DE summary of the teacher's pay and conditions offer at page 52, and an extract from the executive's coronavirus recovery plan at page 54. Can I confirm then that we have Justin McCampbell from NASJUT? Yeah. yeah. Uh, from the NASUWC. Yeah. Uh, Mark McTaggart, my Assistant Northern Secretary for the Irish National Teachers Organisation. Yes. Uh, Jerry Cameron, President of the National Association of Head Teachers. I'm here. You're very welcome. Jackie White, General Secretary, Ulster Teachers Union. Yes. And Mark Langhammer, Regional Secretary from the National Education Union. Yes, here, Chris. Thank you. Okay, you're all very welcome indeed, and we look forward to hearing from you. Um, can I invite the witnesses uh, to brief our committee for no longer than uh, 10 to 15 minutes in total. Um, we look forward to asking questions afterwards then. You're very welcome. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I'm just going to, this is Justin McCampbell, I'm going to uh, lead off on behalf uh, of everyone first. Uh, we wanted first just to talk about uh, the teachers' pay and workload settlement uh, which, which we have reached. 
Uh, one slide talk will be this. Martin McTaggart is going to address the principles underpinning a return. Uh, Jackie White is going to address the medical and health and safety issues. Uh, Jerry Cameron is going to address the leadership issues. And Mark uh, is going to address uh, the delivery of the curriculum. Uh, and we will try and be brief because we know this isn't uh, the usual format. The agreement uh, that we reached that settled uh, the teachers' pay dispute uh, was around three areas. One was on uh, teachers' pay, and I think the figures uh, have, are, are widely known, but just in summary, it was 2.25% uh, for 17-18 and 2% uh, for 18-19. Uh, there are a series of measures that need to be uh, progressed urgently, and we are currently engaging with the employers on that to make sure that they are in place uh, for September. And there are to be a series of nine reviews in key areas. And we are in discussions with the department uh, at the minute as to how, uh, that, that, how those can progress and what resourcing is needed from the department. So I'm, go I'm going to uh, pass you uh, to uh, Mark McTaggart now. Yeah. Uh, more retired on appeal. In terms of the principles, th this isn't really, it's not about reopening schools. A number of schools have, have remained open during the crisis for key workers' children and for vulnerable children. This is really about expanding uh, the provision for, for children of, of school age. And in terms of the, the principles which we feel need to underpin uh, the extension uh, for uh, working within education facilities during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, priority must be given to the safety and the health and well-being of all the staff and pupils and parents involved. Uh, there will be a need for uh, a, co a collaborative approach in developing and implementing protocols within the schools, uh, which would take account of the different contexts that the schools are in. Um, it can't be left to individual schools and individual principals to develop these. Uh, it has to be there has to be some co collaborative work done on that, so it's, everybody is understand what exactly is expected when the schools uh, reopen for normal uh, business. Adequate resources need to be put in place, both physical and financial. Uh, they need need to be made available to schools. Uh, to implement um, the comprehensive health and safety measures that are going to have to be put in place. Um, there, there must be an acknowledgement that for the duration of the public health crisis, that uh, there, there, the changed environment of schools will need to be, re, uh, be accommodated. For example, it, may be it will be necessary to continue the suspension of school inspections and to uh, Spend any new systems level initiatives during this this period of crisis. Uh, when, when schools reopen or expand to to take in more children, due to the probable reduction of the available teachers when schools are open uh, for a variety of COVID-19 related issues, scheme to employ teachers available through NASTER should be developed to allow schools to access a school a, a pool of substitute teachers ready for deployment to schools across all sectors and geographical locations at a short notice. We feel that that would need to be centrally funded. Schools um, shouldn't be uh, financially hit due to the COVID crisis and the implementing the changes that they're need, going to need to come in. So we feel that things like that need to be centrally funded. It will also be important to look at that from the point of view not only of, of teaching staff, but of all school support staff that a similar scheme should be made available to ensure that pupils and teachers have access to adequate support to work in a safe and a secure environment. Okay, I'll pass over to Jack now. Thanks, Mark. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, I just wanted to um, give an overview in terms of um, the, the sort of practical health and medical issues moving forward. Um, obviously, it's paramount that the, the physical and mental health of teachers, support staff and children must be paramount as we move forward. And we see that falling into three broad stages. Um, the first stage is in ensuring that the, 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 the expand, 
expansion of schools, as Mark says, is based on appropriate and robust public health advice. And we would be asking for school health and safety statement in um, conjunction with the Department of Education um, that would be issued to parents along with an induction process. I think what's really important here is that the, both the teachers and, and support staff in the schools, but also the parents, have confidence moving forward as to what schools going to look like as they move forward and that all the appropriate strategies and uh, protections are in place. Then in terms of actually the practical outworkings of that, we would be seeking um, comprehensive risk assessments, again with the engagement of all parties, very uh, transparent so that everybody knows what's going on. And we cannot move forward unless um, any of the risks identified there are, are mitigated again. Um, we are um, seeking comprehensive testing and contact tracing systems, and I think that's something that's coming into place on a general uh, level, but we need to make sure that that applies to the schools as well. Um, one of the issues is around the, the decisions taken on how many children and staff uh, that can be safely accommodated in a school. Um, I would have concerns about the, the blanket kind of numbers that, that have been used in, in England. And we have had um, schools who, whenever they've been seeking to measure out classrooms safely, are ranging from anything from five children to 13 children in a class. So I think it's important that those decisions are taken on a school-to-school -school basis. And obviously there's the need for um, PPE. What is needed and also what is needed in the context of um, curriculum, because you have concerns about PPE and, and the conflict with, for example, practical subjects in post-primary schools. Um, one of the other things uh, that's required, of course, and it was referred, Mark referred to earlier, was the fact that we would have fewer members of staff. We also need to have very clear um, and unambiguous health advice for teachers um, who are in at-risk categories. Um, prior to return and after they return. Um, and for that reason, we think that public health expertise would need to be available to the department and to the stakeholder group. And then in a, on a very practical level, returning into school, we'd be seeking things like a, a thorough deep clean of the school building, very clear guidance about uh, cleaning practices and the appropriate facilities to be externally funded to be put in place, the soap, the hand gel, and, and, and so forth. We're well acquainted with that, but moving forward, we're going to need more of that, and we're going to need um, support in supplying that. There also needs to be an, a very clear acknowledgement about social distancing. We know this is very difficult, particularly with, well, with children generally, but particularly with certain age groups of children, children with particular needs. And there has to be an acknowledgement that it's not one size fits all and it can be difficult to, to um, put that into place. We also have to look at the context of the school, post-primary settings, for example. There's much more movement throughout the school, practical subjects, as I've, I've referenced. So we need to be looking at the pupil intake, um, who comes in when, and how those things are managed around the school. Um, also, in terms of access to the school, there must be very clear practices and procedures in terms of parents' access to the school, essential visitors' access to the school, um, how um, practical things are carried out, like how lunch is provided and so on, and transport, we know, is a huge issue, how those children get to school and come out again. Do we need staggered timings? That those things have to be, have to be taken into account. And finally, just what I would say, there must be a very clear, well understood by all stakeholders procedure if there is to be um, a case identified in a school. Um, schools would need to know well in advance exactly how they respond to that, how they react to that, and have a very clear procedure um, moving forward. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's clear that if we if we can meet those things we can accommodate the children but we need to look at schools on a on a case-to-case -case basis and if they can't meet those things they need to close until a, a process can be worked out mm -hmm. where those things can be fulfilled thank you thanks jackie who's up next it's 
for this opportunity this morning. Um, sorry, sorry to pause you there. Is that, is that Jerry from NAHT? Yep. Nate, yeah. You yeah, you're just breaking up a little bit there, Jerry, but go ahead. Okay. <coughs> well, what I was about to say was that the, the current reaction to the school opening date of the first of in England um, has indicated just how challenging reopening schools is potentially going to be here. Um, and we welcome the fact that there is no calendar as such attached to the step process for school opening in Northern Ireland. Um, I'm going to talk about the challenges of leadership in, in planning and implementation of school reopening. The school leaders are charged with planning and implementing a school reopening regime which ensures the safety of every individual in the school. There will be enormous responsibility on their shoulders and the committee should acknowledge the challenges this will represent. You know but small part to the legitimate fears which still prevail in the community with regards to COVID-19. Um, there is huge potential for anxiety to be increased if the planning phase is mishandled. And I would urge committee to influence as much as they possibly can that school leaders are allowed to play a major part in the consultative piece in planning for reopening. School leaders need to be able to reopen schools with the highest possible levels of confidence that pupils and staff will be as safe as possible. They need to have reliable scientific evidence from the that is based on sound evidence. So we don't want any speculative um, potentially broad information that might lead to sort of, uh, reasons that children are not going to be safe. So the professional judgment of the leaders must be allowed to reveal in the context of their own setting. And I'm referring them to, to nurseries and special schools where they will need to be very specific detailed planning for the, the children. Social distancing, hands on care, will need very careful handling. School leaders will need resources to make any open viable. Extra funds will undoubtedly be required for estimates of equipment for exceeding £10,000 in special schools. So we need to have information that can be funded. School leaders and their time to plan for the evening, and it is not feasible for the throughout the summer break. Um, I know that I have not had a single day of closure um, commence. Um, they've been uh, coordinating, working many hours, things, trying to keep anxiety levels as parents as uh, possible. So they're not disregard given to um, how the process will impact that month. So to, to, to summarise then, safety and science and tracing must be in the plan. There must be funding uh, and for funding and for things put in place. Um, we need to be able to provide our pupils and their parents confidence um, for moving forward in a safe way to open. A key element here is to match the expectations of parents um, and also the impact will had on pupils. Pupils may not point as everybody imagines. There will need to be a recognition. There will need to be uh, one of the for counseling skills for that to be extended. The impact of this period of time by um, will have symptoms of many pupils and maybe many challenges for them in return a blended regime that we are all anticipating. So, um, I'm saying for uh, needs a special mention there. So overall, we need to have confidence in the, uh, the systems that we put in place, and to do that, we need to have time, the resource, and be able to access the consultative process for reopening. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Jerry. Um, I don't know what it was like for other people on the line, but it, it was hard enough to uh, make out some of your contribution. Definitely got the. Um, the, the uh, majority of it and very grateful for it. You, you might want to dial out and back in again on your landline if at all possible just to try and make that clearer for your um, further contributions but thank you very much indeed. Jerry, who's next there? Uh, Mark Langhammer from the National Education Union. Can you, can you hear me? Because I, I couldn't hear very much of that last course, but that, that last contribution. Yeah, you're clear Mark, go ahead. Okay, uh, I want to focus uh, today briefly on 
the type of educational offer or curriculum and particularly the pedagogies involved uh, in the sort of limited school reopening that we're you know probably likely to see in the autumn um, realistically 2020 and 21 next year uh, will be an unusual year also um, it won't be business as usual because reopening is likely to be staged and difficult uh, obviously schools will not be accommodating all pupils at all times so home-based learning will remain at least in part uh, I don't want to put uh, an exact figure on it but my best guess would be that somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of staff would be unlikely to be able to return due to underlying conditions, shielding, pregnancy, caring, etc. Uh, so that's a big chunk of staff. Uh, and in circumstances where the expectation would be that, that class sizes and groups would be would be much smaller, as in Denmark. Um, the other thing would be that, that tailoring learning and differentiation uh, would be very difficult. Uh, there won't likely be very much one-to-one -one tutoring or, or small group work. And that's on top of the adjustments of this year, uh, the major adjustments you're, you're familiar with, the suspension of examinations, the changing role of the inspectors, etc. But teachers have been doing their best to provide daily teaching videos, work packs, uh, but the point I would stress is that the, that the pedagogies involved in supporting remote learners online uh, or at distance are very different to classroom teaching. So uh, getting to what we would like to look at, um, we would like to look at a new or probably better to call it a transitional framework for learning in these exceptional times. Some people Matthews and Matthews in Oxford Bricks, for instance, some people are calling this a recovery curriculum uh, because the, the immediate focus in returning to school should probably be on care, on recovery, on resilience, and on well-being. Pupils, as, 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 as all your members will know, uh, have lost the routines and rhythms of school. They have been isolated to a greater or lesser extent. They have, they have missed their friends, they have missed their peers, to me, the Mr. Teachers. Uh, some will have experienced bereavement. Some will certainly have, you know, experienced financial hardship. Um, special educational needs pupils, especially those with ADHD and ADS, who definitely require more routine and structure, have missed out. So, uh, and we do also have to accept, regrettably, that some families have been disengaged and perhaps have shied away from school activity. Um, so all of those losses for young people uh, in, a, in and of themselves can, can trigger anxiety. So I think the thing that we would say would be uh, the, the sort of language of catching up, making up lost ground, missed work, I don't think that'll connect. I think our priority has to be, and we think our priority has to be about creating a new normal, as we're calling it, uh, reintegrating pupils, providing reassuring environments, Focusing on re-socialization, re-establishing patterns, structure, the habits of learning, uh, focusing on consolidation and reinforcement. Um, and set assessment, for instance, particularly formative feedback, is much more difficult to do remotely. And straightforward linear progress, as teachers would call it, is, is difficult. So I think the, fo the initial focus should be on encouragement, maintaining positive relationships, and maintaining and stimulating the motivation to learn. Now, I'm not going to get in too deep about what this framework for learning that we're asking for should be, but, but at its heart should be a creative curriculum. And the ideas for creative curriculum are myriad. I'm not going to go into them. We'll maybe pick that up with questions and answers. Um, but uh, I mean, our union, for instance, has a resource bank for parents. Many others are doing the same. There is a lot of good work going on. Um, when you get that sort of creative uh, cur curriculum is applicable really to key stage two, one and two, and maybe three, when you get into post-primary GCSE A levels, the sorts of things that we're looking at is not focusing on lost time or catching up. It's actually looking at a slimming of the curriculum. Now, slimming the curriculum is far from easy uh, because very few exam boards order 
you know, which modules should be taken first. So slimming the curriculum is, is not an easy task, but I think it is the right thing to do. So basically our ask is for a framework, framework for learning, a transitional framework for learning, focusing on a creative curriculum with a very light touch accountability system. And we do welcome the move that the ETI have, have published on the DE website. There probably should be a teacher support program but very much in the fact that teachers are the best resource we have, it would be a, a ground up support program. And the other thing that you've already drawn attention to is two of two of our members, Cecilia O'Hagan and Audrey Curry at Strand Millis, have developed a very effective supporting remote learners online course. Um, so there's a, there is a lot of good work going on, and I think maybe I'll leave it at that, uh, Chair, and we can we can pick the rest up by Q and A. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed, Mark. Uh, Justin, do you want to come back in, or happy to move to Q and A? Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, thanks, Chair. I, I think the theme coming through from almost all of the speakers there is around issues of safety and pupil welfare, and those those are at the forefront of what the unions are wanting to do during this process. I suppose before we move to the questions, I just want to put in record our thanks to all those members of the committee. Uh, who were uh, answering queries from substitute teacher members and putting pressure uh, on the minister and the executive uh, to ensure that there was a positive outcome for the substitute teachers. Thank, thanks, Justin. And um, it was ris remiss of me at the at the start in welcoming you not to go into a bit more detail myself as as well. Um, we hopefully you'll have have seen that the committee has has thanked our education sector. Uh, on a weekly basis um, on the record at the committee um, and indeed as you say have been raising a wide range of, of issues that have affected our education sector so can I, can I just emphasize that I'm, I'm delighted that we have the Northern Ireland Teacher Council here today and that we have all your your unions represented here today um, we, we thank you for all the hard work that you all put into achieving uh, a fair teachers' pay and conditions outcome. Um, we were we were extremely delighted to see that progress, and indeed, of course, as you allude to, Justin, the sub teacher pay settlement as well. Can can I make clear my thanks for the the courageous, dedicated, and responsive leadership um, that teachers and and everyone in our education sector has has demonstrated um, throughout the COVID nineteen pandemic. I realise the, the pressure under which teachers, uh, principals, everyone involved in our schools and education sector has been under uh, in responding to this pandemic and the, the child centred and, and the care for the children and young people that has been at the heart of everything that you've done. Uh, also to, to recognise the absolute need for the education sector to be at the heart of planning for that phased expansion of school opening um, and hopefully this is a, a good start at ensuring the facilitation of that. Uh, so very clear thanks to you for, for all the, the work and, and dedication that has been ongoing for, for so long and our, our ongoing commitment to work with you to ensure that we help you to achieve positive outcomes for our children and young people in, in Northern Ireland. Um, can I can I ask on on that note then are are you uh, content at this stage with the level of engagement that you've had from the Department of Education um, with regards to that phased uh, expansion of of school opening? Uh, we are content with the engagement we've had so far. However, uh, we're not just too sure of what's coming next. But we do know the minister uh, will be briefing you later. Um, Going by some media reports, he may be outlining a plan uh, for schools reopening, I suppose, from September. Uh, so we have a bit of uncertainty around what's happening with that. Okay. But overall, in, in terms of all our engagements with department officials, uh, we have been uh, meeting with them twice a week, and they have been keeping us fully informed and liaising with us uh, on everything up to now. So we hope that that continues. Okay, and we'll uh, we'll obviously push for that as well. I I, I noticed, I think I noticed media um, coverage late last night of a ministerial announcement today. Not sure if that was accurate or not, Justin. 
Um, I have no um, pre-notice whatsoever of a, a, a ministerial announcement with regards to the phased expansion of school opening today. So, um, similarly to you, we, we await any announcement and, and we can respond constructively to that. Um, okay. Can I, can I also ask then, um, obviously in terms of examinations, um, GCSE and, and A-level exams, um, will be uh, a calculated grade on this occasion. Um, I think Mark um, made some allusion to the need for a, an adjusted curriculum for um, not this year's uh, GCSE and A-levels, but um, next year's. Um, obviously, we also have AQE and PPTC um, have announced a, a delay to their tests that are were scheduled for the autumn. Um, would anybody like to respond further in terms of what is going to be needed for um, the the for, not not this year's GCSE and A level um, grading, but next year's in terms of an adjusted curriculum? And would would you be aware um, or or have a, a position on the announcement with regards to AQE and PPC, PPTC tests, and be aware of any school contingency plans that are in place? Um, should those tests not be able to take place similarly to this year's GCSE and A-levels? I think, Chair, it's Mark Langhammer here. If I can briefly come in on the, on the first issue. Um, I, I think the, the, is, the, the, the issue for you and us is that nobody knows. Nobody knows exactly uh, how quickly uh, schools will, will reopen and to what degree. And because of that, uh, I think we are going to have the same issue with GCSE and A level next year as we do this year. So the, the simple ask, I guess, rather than getting into the detail of it, would be that, that if, if DE and SIA could, could uh, uh, engage in, in a very early consultation before next academic year. Okay, that, that's helpful. And, and anyone, um wish to respond to uh, the, the delay that's been announced to the AQE and PPTC tests and whether there's any awareness of uh, school contingency plans, should they not be able to take place? Yeah, this is uh, Justin here on that. I mean, we're aware uh, of the plan and if that's plan B, uh, we do think the voluntary grammar schools uh, need to be factoring in, but what will they do? If, uh, if that can't go ahead, because we're not prepared to go down the road of asking our members in primary school to be to rank order pupils uh, in the same way as it's done for GCSE and A level. Okay, but n not aware of any contingency plans then? No. Uh, no, we're, we're not aware of any contingency plans, and I think because these are non statutory tests. Uh, there have been there's there's no consultation with trade unions at any stage on how these tests uh, operate. So we are uh, totally out of the loop on that. Okay. Chris, Chris, can you hear me any clear any more clearly now? Yeah, that, Jerry, is, that is slightly better, Jerry. Yep, thank you. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, nobody can fail to have noticed the the reaction media to the the transfer um, the announcement. And the anxiety that the exam causes um, on an annual basis, whether you're uh, either for it or against it, has been enhanced this year. And I think it behoves all of us um, in the system to try and minimise the impact that that will be having on the listening ears of 10, 11 year olds at the moment um, who are the, the, the protagonists in this. I mean, they're, they're the children that are going to be party to the, the outworkings of this. So I think it behoves every um, individual in this in the debate at the moment to be careful about how they, um, they react to any outworkings of any change to the system. And it is an opportunity to, to get an ethical and moral debate going on, on the future of this exam. I think that we need to see that as this is an opportunity, but I would just caution people to be careful about um, the degree of anxiety that they're engendering in, in such young minds at the moment. Okay. Anyone else wish to respond on that? No. Yeah, Mark McTaggart, just... Yep. Very quickly, in terms in terms of uh, transfer tests or, or academic selection, our position has been the same for the last 40 years that it shouldn't be there. But in terms of this year, it's very, I mean, it's very easy. If these, if these unregulated tests can't go forward, 
what then needs to be done is the schools have to look at their entrance uh, criteria and take the academic selection part of it out and use the criteria that all, all other schools would use. That would be the fairest way of doing it. As, as Justin has pointed out, we aren't going to ask our members to rank order children in the primary school because that's not the, the way the assessments go in normal primary school life. Okay, thanks very much indeed. I just have one other question before I bring in members who will have uh, a number of questions. Um, we, we, we've, I've actually got to the point where I'm, I'm starting to have people seriously suggest to me that it, it may be worth considering um, a, a restart of, of this school year rather than um, passing to the next school year. Has, has that been discussed um, with any of your members and do you have any reaction to that? Uh, we haven't had any real discussion on it, uh, but this is Justin. I've seen it uh, mentioned briefly on some corners uh, of the internet, but uh, the reality is I don't think that was a fair on Justin. Uh, and it's them it's Justin, you're uh, breaking up a little bit there. Can you... Can you sorry, see, yep. we, I was going to say, we were more than two-thirds of the way uh, through the academic year, uh, so I don't think it would be necessary uh, to, to repeat the year. I do, though, think in terms of, I think Mark alluded to it earlier, in terms of the content of the curriculum at GCSE and A-level, I think we need to look at the amount of content, but still pitched at the same level, so that we can still get a measure uh, of the progress of children through the system. Okay. Anyone else wish to respond? Uh, sorry, yeah. Chris, could I just say, I mean, I, I, I would be very concerned about repeating a year or even considering dispatching what has already happened. As Justin said, we were well through the academic part of the year, and in many uh, instances, children or young people would now be going off to do study leave for their examinations. So I would guard against that. and. Uh, I mentioned earlier about parental expectations and you know all parents out there want the best for their children they will not want them to have been disadvantaged by this pandemic um, and so I think it behoves again the educational workforce to work as much as possible to minimize the disadvantage that, that children and young people might experience as a result of this and I think we, we need to have a nod to the resilience of, of young people and how how quickly they can adapt and catch up, um, provided that the planning and preparation goes in for the reopening phase properly, they shouldn't uh, suffer uh, any further. Um, so it's, it's on all of our, um, our tables to try and get this right at the moment, Chris, and I would hate to think that a child who has had a really good year up to now would see that go to waste. That, that, that would be dreadful. Okay. Anyone else wish to respond? Yeah, this is this is Jackie from UTU. I think just to add to that, I would I would agree with what Jerry has said, but I think then moving forward, maybe I'm thinking more in terms of primary level. Um, just referring back to what Mark has said about you know creativity and flexibility around the curriculum, children are going to be returning at all sorts of different stages, and I think it would be fairly obvious that teachers in the next year, possibly two years, will not be necessarily moving forward in, within the normal pattern of what they would have laid out for the school year. So I think it's just a case of letting um, the teachers put their professional judgment in place and deal with the children in their class at, at the different rates that they're moving forward um, and ensuring that we have that flexibility and understanding that, that things will look different just in the, in the near future. I think that really speaks to what Mark said then in terms of that yeah. um, phased um, expansion of school opening, having care, recovery, resilience and well-being at its, at its core. Uh, and, and in addition to that flexible curriculum, that, that's really helpful. I appreciate those responses. Thank you. Uh, I'll bring in uh, my, my colleagues now as well then, starting with uh, Karen Mullen, Deputy Chairperson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, I, and for those uh, oral patients and tips that you have provided, but also want to thank you for all your hard work that you have done over the last couple of weeks and months. Uh, as uh, I think it was Jerry said, um, uh, we recognise that you have not had a day off either, as many of our teaching staff as well, and we want to thank you all for that. The time ahead, um, there's going to be a lot of hard work, um, and we will all have to pull together. 
on it. Um, uh, and it just the conversation, I suppose, about returning the skull. A lot of what Chief of Up did it um, did answer many of my questions. Obviously, there's a, a, a huge level of concern and anxiety out there um, that, that you have uh, raised here as well. Um, cause they, you have also presented many of the areas that need to be looked at and planned for, and the principals and schools need to be involved in that. Um, do you also believe that parents and young people and other stakeholders need to be involved in that? This, this is Jackie from the GE. Um, referring back to what I mean, I was focusing on, on the, the health issues, but I think one of the huge issues is per, um, parental confidence in the system. And I think there must be engagement of parents in that respect moving forward so that they're very clear, um, even at that, this stage when parents, do you love them, have been you know, trying their best to keep the homeschooling going. Um, yep. They still have that concern about sending children back to a formal setting, and I think it's it's very important that as we move forward, all of those stakeholders are involved because it's not going to be enough for um, the, the staff and the schools and and the, the people within the system, if you like, to understand clearly what's happening as we move forward. We must engage the parents in that so that we can build their confidence back up to send the children to school in the first place. Hi, Hi Aaron. Aaron. It's uh, yes, Jerry yes. here from NAHD. Um, I totally agree with you. I think partnerships are always important in school, uh, parent-home relationships or school-home relationships. Um, and I think that we need to be very cognizant of the fact that Anxiety levels will increase the closer that this comes, and so yeah. it is, it's going to be incumbent on all of us to make sure that the messaging going home is that the school has been enabled to do everything it can to ensure that the risk to their child is as low as it possibly can be. I mean, nobody can eradicate risk entirely. And I would um, do a, a bit of a shout out here for the, the plight of um, children uh, in special schools and yeah. children with additional needs in mainstream schools because you know, they've had a particularly challenging struggle over the last uh, few weeks and months um, while the schools have been closed. And I know there's lots of uh, opportunities have been put in place by other agencies and by teachers and, and school principals to try and minimise that. However, the, the return to school for those children um, with complex health needs and so on needs to be really carefully managed. And I would just urge everyone to try and support those schools with all the, the safety equipment that they need, the resources that they need, um, and to be able to instill the confidence in their parents that those vulnerable children will be safe in the school environment. But it's absolutely a partnership, Karen. Um, I totally agree with you. Brilliant. And I suppose we'll be getting an update from the department. Um, you are saying that uh, you have updated us that you are already involved in it, and I suppose just chatting to them around the next stage and how they involve all, all those stakeholders. And Jerry, you're right, you know, the, those specific groups have missed out on so much and it needs to be carefully managed. Um, I know you've are, you've, NEU has provided a, a paper here today, which um, uh, uh, is a good paper and a good starting business, and I know you're all working on it. But if we could maybe get a paper on what resources and costs will be needed. I know that was uh, outlined in your briefing as well, because there is going to be a big budget requirement for all of this going forward. Um, just on the teacher's pay, thankfully yesterday the sub-teacher's pay has um, been resolved as such, but my main worry and concern at looking at the stuff last night was that um, on the, the first payment will not be received until the 16th of June, um, uh, and I just feel that that is too long. It's three months without, um, nearly three months without a payment, three months that you're out of school. And um, I just wanted to maybe check how you feel about that. And then also just on relation to it, this has shown the difficulties in, in terms of contracting our sub-teachers. And I think it's very timely. I know I've spoken to some of these in the past around the employment model of sub-teachers. I think it really needs to be reviewed in this time going ahead. And um, uh, just maybe if you have any detail in relation to has that been further progressed? Okay, uh, this is Justin, uh, uh, Karen. Uh, there is to be a review of the employment model of substitute teachers uh, within uh, the reviews as part of the pay and workload agreement. We have done substantial.
substantial work on this uh, four years ago and have yeah. made progress. But uh, the department's business case uh, was never was never progressed. Uh, so the unions do want uh, do want to revisit that. And I think, as uh, my other colleague Mark McTaggart mentioned earlier, uh, there is going to be a big role for substitute teachers uh, co come September uh, to cover uh, for teachers uh, who have been advised uh, not not to be in schools. In relation to uh, making the payments. Uh, my understanding is that this comes from uh, the Danny payroll system. Uh, schools, uh, on a normal basis, uh, submit uh, their substitute uh, payments uh, to Danny, and then they're paid 12 or 13 working days uh, later. I think the question you should be asking uh, the department when they're in with you is, can that at time when they'll be shortened uh, so that the substitute teachers uh, can get their payments uh, for April and May uh, sooner than they would normally. Uh, related to that is the issue of when the back pay uh, for the pay settlement is going to be uh, progressed. And many substitute teachers have been asking, well, if that could happen uh, sooner rather than later, uh, that would make a big difference to them. And that's probably part of the wider question is, uh, when is that uh, payment going to come? We were initially told uh, end of June, July. I haven't heard any difference, but if that money could get uh, to substitute teachers as well, that would make a big difference to them. Thank you, Justin. Okay. Um, just, Chris, just final point. Yep, I suppose we, it, it, it was raised there, and it's relation to the transfer test. Um, and rather than abruptly trying to prepare our young people for this unregulated unre unre test when they start school in September. We should be ensuring that they have the necessary support and guidance to help them get back on their feet. And I couldn't agree more with how Mark Langhamel put it in his presentation. Our, our curriculum should be on recovery, should be on care and well-being. Um, but uh, I just wanted to ask, are, are any of the unions aware um, that any of the gram grammar schools may uh, of their intentions to move away from an academic selection this year? Um, so Justin here, we haven't we haven't heard of any. No, no, neither do we. No. we neither do we. No. No. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can I? <clears throat> Thank the delegation, uh, Mr. McCampbell, Mr. Taggart, uh, Cameron, Ms. Cameron, Ms. White, and indeed Mark Langhammer um, for, for being with us today. And what I think probably is a very busy schedule uh, for, for them. And I, I do think the briefing and indeed the information that they have provided is extremely helpful as we try to gain an understanding of the the thinking of the trade unions as we move forward in this uh, uh, difficult days, and indeed the work that's being done uh, as as we move forward, I don't I don't have any. Uh, I'd like to make a, an inquiry, Trevor. But I don't have any specific questions. Uh, I do agree that with, with the theme of what the the five representatives were putting forward, we are in uncharted territory. Uh, we are indeed in a new normal. Um, safety of our staff uh, in schools and safety of the pupils uh, must be paramount. In indeed, the confidence of the parents uh, that as they send the children uh, to schools. I think the, the, the work that is being done, uh, which was referenced about developing new skills, I think is, is going to be extremely important as we as we move forward, uh, and indeed tackling those mental health issues, which I uh, think will only come uh, to, to the fore at a later stage, and uh, a creative collective approach uh, to, to all of these issues. I, I would like, and I don't think it's a, 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 a large explanation that is needed at this stage, but Mark Langhammer made reference to a creative curriculum. It's a an area of work that I've been interested in uh, for, for many years. Um, that maybe if you could give us just a few words on that, and if that could be, uh, we could receive a follow-up paper uh, from Mark on that, Chair. Thanks, Rob. Mark, do you want to come in briefly on that? 
Yes, thanks very much, Chair. Uh, I think actually we, we provided to Mark McQuaid, and I think he indicated that he had circulated a short paper on this this morning. Uh, it's about four pages long. But uh, to, to answer Robin's questions, um, I mean, the sorts of things that you, you'd be looking at, uh, certainly at, at primary level, you know, we're looking at science through baking and cooking. Uh, understanding plant life and foods through growing seeds, making things, physical exercise is important. Um, some schools I've heard of, of, of young people making sense of this disorientating situation through things like mood boards or relationship webs. Going back to basics with reading for pleasure, you know, uh, a book, an article, a, a magazine, writing. Um, who would have thought jigsaws would make a comeback, but we've heard of some uh, pupils making jigsaws for their grandparents, uh, sharing pictures, writing to friends, teachers, pen friends, remember them. Um, project work in, in twos or threes where, where young people could keep in touch with two or three other young people to, to work on a project. Um, I also think we should be encouraging helping in the home and you know, helping in your area or your community or your estate because those sorts of assistances help forge res resilience and self-worth. But there really are a there really are a myriad of ideas out there. Some very good ideas. Um, we've come across a lot of good resources from a, an organisation called Writing to Succeed. Um, but and, and as I said, we we have on our own website a, a very large resource bank for parents. Um, so there, 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 is a, there is a lot going on, and uh, I don't think ideas is what we'll be short of in developing a, a creative trans a transitional curriculum. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Robin. Not okay? Uh, yeah, can I thank uh, Mark for that? And uh, uh, I think I'd like to join with the Deputy and indeed in thanking and expressing my thanks to the, the, uh, all of the teachers that, that have been working uh, with our pupils uh, over this difficult period. Sure. Thanks, Robin. Daniel McCrossan. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Just to follow on from others and thanking um, our re uh, union reps for being here today and for the great work that they've been doing um, over recent times, and also to put on record as well my appreciation to our teachers and teaching workforce out there, those who uh, have worked tirelessly to support children uh, in these uh, uncertain uh, times. Also, as you'll, you'll know, Chair, just as an open remark, I'm delighted with the sub-teacher announcement. Um, uh, for the last number of weeks, we've constantly battled uh, with the Department in relation to it, and there'll be some relief to that. I know the union representatives have mentioned it there as well. I'll just start off in terms of, um, uh, in, in the presentation, some of the papers, it says that, that, that uh, the union representatives have ad advocated the slimming down of GCSE and the A-level syllabus for 2021. Uh, while this is understandable under the circumstances, how could it be done so that some employers do not think that the qualifications are devalued in any way? I, I think they may have to accept that the first Justin that the qualifications are, are different, but if the curriculum was slimmed down in such a way that, the, that it's still at the same level of difficulty, but with less content, uh, then employers should know that the uh, skills learned are, are, are still the same. Yeah, well, that, that's an important, important clarification and I'm just concerned in relation to that. Could I just uh, come in, Daniel, sorry, and, and okay. add to that and say that um, despite the sort of the variations in access that young people have had to the curriculum in terms of digital access and so on, you know, teaching and learning has continued, um, and many young people, you know, will have kept up to speed with their examination subjects, notwithstanding the fact that they can't do practicals and things like that. But, you know, I don't think we can um, write off the, the contribution of distance learning that has been made by the, the teaching workforce um, and that has been uptaken, you know, to quite a, a, a large extent by many of the exam pupils that are, are preparing for in, in year 11 and year 13. So, you know, we shouldn't write that off and we should maybe allow um, teachers to see to what extent that has had an impact when children return, young people return to school uh, whenever they do um, before any major decision is made about um, you know, reducing the, the validity of these exams. I think that's important. Okay. Um, 
another point just to raise is uh, the NEU uh, uh, will use a, use a like to prioritise the children's social and emotional needs above the curriculum once they return to school. Um, the full curriculum should, uh, it's believed that the full curriculum should be suspended. Uh, the, the, um, just because many children think that we'll, they'll be grieving and their mental health will be affected. Um, is it also the case that, uh, uh, do, has any other country, for instance, uh, who has opened its schools to date uh, done this? And do you believe parents will be happy with this considering how uh, much school children have, will have missed uh, in terms of the curriculum? Yes, thank, thanks for the contribution. I mean, the the model that the that the UK is using at the minute to to reopen schools is is very much based on the Denmark model, and the Denmark model uh, look it hasn't thrown out the curriculum. It, it is it is just accepted that it can't be the same, and uh, as human beings, we're we're social creatures, and likewise, teaching is a relationship or a relational. Profession. So, if if we don't deal with the uh, elements of anxiety and well-being uh, and sense of loss, because young people have, uh, you know, lost uh, contact with with their friends and their peers and their teachers. Uh, so, how long that transitional period lasts is another question. But I think the the immediate priority should be mm. on on re-establishing. Patterns, structures, habits of learning, and motivation to learn. Uh, I know where you're coming from, and it's a fair point, but, but that's what we would say. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, okay. That's like the small final point, Chair. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Dan. Just could ask, do you, do you see the role of schools as ensuring families have access to meals, food banks, and other services such as physical activities? as a, uh, much a priority as getting children settled into normal school work. And also, uh, the, I, I appreciate that these are important, uh, even uh, uh, important and vital services to families, but do you think that teachers would consider this uh, as increasing their workload at a time when they're already under massive pressure to normalize school experience whenever we get back to uh, a time when, when, when we're back at schools? And should other agencies, such as the Education Welfare Service, not be responsible for delivering um, these important services that are mentioned? Well, I, I think it might be worth pointing out that teachers currently, this is Justin, currently aren't responsible for delivering uh, those things that is the education authority is responsible for uh, the provision of, of, of meals. Uh, and I do know, though, in many schools that there will be uh, teachers and head teachers involved in supervision, and but uh, that's something that does lie uh, with the education authority, and I don't foresee how or why it should increase workload on teachers. I'm just conscious. Well, well, first of all, any of the teachers that I have spoken to, even prior to the outbreak of this virus, will have told me and other elected representatives that the pressure mounted to them within the classroom environment has been. Uh, significant, particularly increasing over recent years with some of the complexities of the individual circumstances of children. So if you take that prior to COVID and then add in the complexity and the seriousness of the COVID situation, uh, surely there will be an appreciation that all of these demands on a teacher in a large classroom uh, will add significant pressure to them. And I understand that you said that the Education Authority uh, is, a responsibility body, is a responsible body, and I've mentioned that by, by citing the Educational Welfare Service. Uh, my, my view is just simply uh, of concern here that we'll be putting significant pressure on uh, these teachers when we do return uh, to uh, expect them to be all things in the classroom and deal with the various layers of complex need that is uh, going to present itself. And I'm just wondering, as the unions have con any conversation with the education authority to ensure that there's support services in place to take the pressure off these teachers and obviously support for children when they return. Daniel, can I come in there? Um, it, th this is going to be a collective. There's no doubt about it. Um, we need to make sure that the outworkings of the, the end of the pay dispute are implemented in schools and the teachers' uh, workload is, is addressed. There's no doubt about that. And there's certainly um, 
plans in place to address, make sure that that happens. However, um, when we return to school in September, or whenever we return to school, um, every agency involved with enabling that will have to step up to the mark. And there has been conversations, as Justin alluded to, at the, di the, the weekly dialogues with DE with regards to the contribution that the Education Authority will need to make and how responsive those contributions will need to be. Um, because there, there won't be any um, room for prevarication or waiting or communicating between departments. Children will need, and staff and uh, head teachers in school will need, a very quick response to all their needs to try and make, make a safe return to school possible. The, the whole system has been exposed um, as being somewhat unresponsive um, and um, slow to react. Um, and we've seen that with uh, the, how, how difficult it's been to enable digital access for all our pupils in, in Northern Ireland. So there's lessons here for everyone. But all of this, the return to school can only happen effectively in partnership with every agency. And every agency needs to be willing to step up and contribute. And it can't all land on teachers or schools' uh, plates. Okay. I'm going to need to move on shortly. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, Chair. Can I come back just on the... Point yep. raised about workload. I probably should have said in my response I was only dealing with that, what I thought was the narrow point around the, the, the meal provision. Uh, there will be extra workload uh, on teachers, so we need to actually think about it, particularly with blended learning. Uh, if teachers are going to be responsible uh, for supervising half a class and teaching another class uh, online at the same time, that's not going to be feasible. So whatever plan is put in place is going to have to ensure that teachers are doing uh, one or the other, uh, but not both. Okay, Daniel. Okay, if, if I could come in, Chris, just very briefly, because the, the, the point that Daniel raises is a very important point, because you know we're, teachers will not be able to keep juggling all balls. Now, I referred to Denmark, and, and it wasn't because they're obsessed about it. It's because the UK government cites it repeatedly as, a, as an example that they are following. But in Denmark, uh, with the return to schools, they've reduced class sizes to 10, that the, the pupil-teacher ratio is, is 1 to 10. And within that, they have a group or pod learning, they call it, of, of groups of three or four with very strict social distancing. Like, clearly something along those lines would cost money and um, in all probability it would, uh, it, would, it would force us into the bank of supply teachers and substitute teachers that we have, but there is a cost to that. So if, if we are going to do this safely and return to school safely, uh, the, the class ratios are important and the, and the social distancing is important. So yes, there's a cost to that. and, and uh, it, it can't be on, on teachers to keep all balls juggling in the air all the time. Okay, Daniel. Yeah, Chair, I did have a final point, but uh, um, what, could you indulge me slightly? Go, go ahead, very briefly. Uh, I'm just wondering what you think about CS plans to use teacher assessment for GCSE and A-levels. This year, I know it was touched on during the presentations, but should CS uh, provide some level of moderation for the process? And what do you think about the proposed appeal process that will be put in place? Do you think parents, for instance, will accept no appeal against teacher judgment, especially if there's no moderation of it? I, I think this is Justin. I think it's wrong to say there's no moderation. There is internal moderation uh, within schools. Uh, our view is that this is the best uh, that can be done in a very difficult situation. Um, the appeal process, I think, uh, is still ongoing. Uh, sorry, the consultation on the appeal process is still ongoing. Our main concern uh, from a teacher union point of view is around data, data protection uh, because we believe teachers have a difficult enough job to do without people uh, coming back and challenging uh, rank ordering. And I know parents are going to find that difficult, uh, but we didn't expect to be in the situation we're in. And um, ultimately, yes, if somebody doesn't like their response, doesn't like their grade, they do have the opportunity to reset it the following year. I know that's not what parents want to hear, but I don't see what the alternative is. Okay, gonna move on, Daniel. Can I bring Robbie Butler in, please? Thanks. Yes, sir, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, um, just wanna thank uh, each of you for your contribution so far. And what I would like to, to state is that it was uh, great to note that throughout everything that you've had to say, it 
was people centred, and I know you guys are the, the teachers rep body, so you could rightly come on here and and discuss all the pressures on teachers. But it has been refreshing to note that a big focus today has been putting the child at the centre of the discussion. Um, I'll make a couple of points and just see if you can respond to them. They may not even sound like questions, but the first one would be particularly in around Mark Langhammer's um, piece on um, compassionate and practical approach to return to education. I think that has to be our absolute focus. Um, previous to the COVID uh, pandemic, child poverty was on each of our lips. In 2020, we're talking about child poverty. We're talking about the reality um, of the scale of the issue. We're, we're talking about the correlation between poverty, trauma, poor health, educational opportunity and attainment. And these things have been comprehensively established before. Um, they're going to be exacerbated um, through the inequalities that uh, those in the margins of our society are faced with, with the, the, the lack of provision, for instance, of IT, technology, the uh, other burdens that Mark even talked about, which was the trauma that's happening, the, the, the further uh, exposure to poverty, further exposure to perhaps trauma. Um, we've got the parental pressures that are coming on our children. And I think, you know, one of the things that I've learned, and I didn't learn it in school, unfortunately, I wish I had known this, that schools are perhaps our safest, most level playing field environment for all of our children. But a return to that environment needs to be put in public safety at the core. And these, these conversations are really, really important. And, and, and I did spend some time last night looking through, and I'm sure you guys have it. There's a uh, so, uh, the National Children's Bureau um, put out a piece and it's, it, it makes fantastic reading it's called Reconnect and uh, one of the things they talk about there it's a report I think uh, the Stafford report I think it's called the, sorry the Sutton Trust report on children accessing online learning at the moment in England and they're talking about a third of children um, accessing online learning so the, the disparity in what people are, children are learning at the moment is marked so the, a return to the, the, the common curriculum and uh, without putting a flag in the sand would be would be a disaster. I feel I, I know that, uh, and we, we will talk to the permanent secretary later on about this. I think we are measuring it in terms of what schools are providing. So I think 95% of schools are using online learning, but that doesn't tell us how many pupils are accessing it. And I, I, I would be concerned about that. So it was, it was refreshing to see that you guys seem to be putting this um, to. To the force. So we'll just ask you in terms of if you had a look at the National Children's Bureau piece um, and if there's any learning from that um, that we could weave into the conversation. And the only other thing then, Chair, uh, was in and around HUE. So if I did have one disappointment just uh, in what was discussed today, uh, was and I, maybe I picked this up wrong, um, but I, and I know you guys uh, represent a diverse sector. There did, maybe didn't seem to be one collective voice. So I'm not even sure if you guys have. Have, have, have sort of come together with a common message that would be a stronger message to go to the minister and say that this absolutely has to be delayed longer uh, than it has been uh, put forward and we need to be agile and innovative in how we put the people at the centre of this discussion. Okay, thanks Robbie. Anyone want to respond? Yeah, yes, Chris, Mark Langhammer here. I, I, I welcome those comments and, and yes, we, we were aware and, and quite alarmed at the Sutton Trust research which identifies a very significant uh, percentage of young people who, who, who have, I don't want to word, use the word switched off, but who aren't accessing online learning. Now, that's one of the reasons why uh, I stress that in the teaching cadre that we have, brilliant though they are, uh, the, 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 the pedagogies of classroom teaching differ very, very considerably from the from the skills of supporting remote learners online, and for that reason, I think there is a need. And Karen talked about costs earlier, but there is a need for some sort of uh, program. The Strand course is a good start, but you know, some sort of a program where each school has some capacity, some trained capacity for for developing their pedagogy and online learning. I, in a previous life, I led the Learn Direct e-learning initiative uh, in the early days of the internet. You know, when we were trying to do online learning with a 56k modem, but you know, it, it, it is much more coaching and mentoring based than, than classroom teaching. And I think that, that a small amount of money could go a long way there. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, Rebecca right, in there, um, and just um, maybe uh, introduce a, a slight reassurance that you know everyone would accept that there are huge variations in um, the application and aptitude and attitude of children and young people in schools when they're in school. So the you know the digital divide, while it is um, a very big concern in terms of the quality of access to decent Wi-Fi and devices and so on. Um, even if we were to get 100% coverage um, for every child in Northern Ireland, there would still be variation in uptake. And we can't construe that as trauma. We can't construe that always as, um, as, as something negative. It is simply a fact that there is variation in the, the, the attitude of, of children and young people. And, and some need, are more motivated than others. Some need more assistance than others. So we, we need to keep this in perspective. You know, children are resilient and our, our young people have the capacity to recover. What they actually need are the facilities to be able to do that. They need access to counselling and primary schools. They need uh, extension uh, of the access to counselling and post-primary schools. Those things are practical um, decisions that can be taken now in advance of reopening so that they're there. That responsiveness in the system that I mentioned earlier needs to be there so that we don't, uh, we don't have these children and young people waiting for things to be in place, that they are there whenever they need them when they go back, so that their resilience can be maximised. So, you know, I would be very positive um, about our young people's ability to, to bounce back, providing we give them the facilities to do so. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Robbie. Yeah, if I could just come back on that, yeah, I think Jerry's absolutely right. Sometimes we do underestimate the ability for our young people um, to... Uh, use even instances like this to grow when it is part of life, but there is no doubt in that the prevalence of um, uh, mental ill health in Northern Ireland and in our young people is, is, is disproportionately high, and it is tied to poverty, and it is tied to lack of opportunity, and yes, there's a decision to be made, but if the, if the, if the, if the resourcing isn't there in the first place um, for that offer to be made, then it's an inequality, but I, I know that um, there's, there's ongoing work um, that can be done, and we are in a phase of a process I just think we, need, we absolutely need to keep our eye on the ball and ensure that everybody is, is, is uh, has the, uh, certainly the availability of equity uh, in terms of rules and provision of education and uh, sustenance. Okay. Thanks, Robbie. Yeah. Uh, I need to, can I move on and maybe let you come in on that uh, for uh, via another question? Um, can I bring William Humphrey in, please? Thanks, Chairman. Um, and good morning, everybody, and thanks very much for your time uh, this morning. Uh, it's appreciated. Um, in terms of the, I just want to join with colleagues in terms of paying tribute to those who work in the school and education family and all that they're doing at this most difficult time. It's hugely appreciated by uh, parents and the young people out there. Um, just listening to, to some of the answers and the presentations, um, I think the point that um, Mark Langhammer made that um, no one knows is the key point here. No one does know, and that includes all of us. In this meeting, it includes the minister, it includes the chief medical officers and whatever, no, no matter how much uh, information they will have, medical or scientific, no one really knows uh, in terms of this thing. It is so uncertain, that's what creates much of the difficulty. Mark, you made the point, I think it was 20 to 40 percent of staff may not be able to return because of various issues uh, should schools have to go back. Uh, I think that was what you said, wasn't it? Mark? Sorry, I was just unmuting, William. Uh, okay. Yes, uh, and I don't want to, I don't want to, to, to over-egg this. Uh, that, that is a very rough assess. We have a very small number of school principals in membership, and I did a ring around mm. uh, and got through to seven or eight of them, and, and that was the sort of range that we were talking, so it's a very, very limited sample. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, so okay. Well, just, just, just building on that point then, Jackie, I think you made the point that before schools go back, there need to be funding in place. Um, uh, and I, I think it was a very bad line, so I think that's what you were saying. Can I ask you to expand what you mean by that? What, what type of funding and for what? The, the, the point I was making about funding? Yeah. Mm. Um, well, just whenever you're referring actually to the, the unavailability of, of some members of staff, there's obviously going to have to be funding put in place in terms of um, staff being put into those schools in order to, to manage it. And it wouldn't, mm. be, um, you know, it wouldn't be coming out of the, the, the school budget. 
But there was also funding, because I, I was talking about the, um, the sort of the health issue, there was funding around making sure that there's adequate provision for um, all of the, the, the safety equipment that's required, the resources that will be required moving forward. Is that, is that I had referred to that? Um, I'm just... You see, yeah. William, just, William, William had, you, had you said Jerry on? Oh. Jackie there? What? Yes, yeah, but I'm happy to come in there as well. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, there are some estimates in special schools of the, the quantum that will be required for PPE equipment. Uh, it runs in the thousands of pounds per month, so there's concerns there. Other concerns around um, the practicalities of deep cleaning uh, equipment that uh, every single day, so that's going to be a, an additional resource. Yeah particularly, you know, in, in schools where the children learn through touch and learn through play, you know, the early years and special schools. So th there's concerns there, but also the provision of extra washing stations for hand washing, um, all the, the security around um, making sure that um, there are, is appropriate entrance and exits to schools. I mean, some schools have multiple entrances. Um, there's going to need to be a little bit of um, capacity put in there to make, make sure that schools can have safe uh, exits and, and entrances. So yeah. there's, there's, there's lots of practical yep. considerations that are going to require funding, and school leaders are massively concerned about, about that at the okay. moment. So, so given all those points that you've all made, and I, I listen intently to them, I mean, do you guys have a collective position as when you think it would be actually be safe and practical for people to go back to school? Um, if Justin here, I don't know that necessarily there would be a, a collective position, but I imagine we're all on the same page. Uh, on well, a, is that not the same thing then? Well, collective well, position on the same page? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I think each individual union wants uh, children to be able to return uh, when it's safe to do so, yeah. uh, but not until then. And we believe the executive's five-point plan uh, is, the, is the way to go, where we actually monitor uh, the R value and how safe things are uh, before we proceed. Yeah, uh, I think that's a, uh, ultimately far better than the process that has been undertaken in England. Yeah, and I think that's the point. There's been considerable criticism of the executive's plan because it hasn't put dates on. But when you listen to the sort of evidence that you've given this morning, you can understand yeah. why that's the case. Yes. Um, and, and what we have to do here in everything in Northern Ireland is try and get the balance protecting lives, driving down the R, as you've said, uh, and, but at the same time give people hope that we can return to normality mm -hmm. uh, as well, because obviously lots of people are seeking that. Can, just a final question then would be, um, I mean, I would have concerns, and I would be interested in your response to this, in terms of the fact that children are being uh, taught remotely at the moment, obviously each household will have different access to different resource, and whether that, you know, it's parental resource, whether it is financial resource in terms of buying in um, aids for the children, internet connections uh, and, and computer technology and all of that. I am genuinely concerned that, that the more um, hard to reach communities or, or more deprived communities and households where perhaps there isn't as much disposable income, those young people are going to be placed at a disadvantage. Can I just ask your views on that? Can I come in on that, um, William? Um, I agree with you that there is huge variation across the country, but I would again pay tribute to the response of the, the teaching staff uh, and the leadership in schools in those positions because there's been incredibly innovative practice um, in providing the click and collect hard copy packs of work on a weekly basis in, in remote rural areas and so on. Um, very good networking with parents uh, electronically through WhatsApp groups and so on to try and minimise um, any gaps in, in provision or a gaps at, uh, in, in a children's access. So, you know, the, the teaching workforce and the school leader workforce has really stepped up to try and minimise that. Uh, it hasn't been helped by the fact that there is, um, a, you know, a high level of deprivation in many parts of Northern mm. Ireland and the responsiveness of the system, because the, the shutdown came so quickly, you know, the ability to lend out devices to children who maybe don't have, um, you know, large, uh, or maybe there's a shared device in the house or whatever, that, that maybe could have been handled better. But there, there are steps, there are moves now to, 
try and um, alleviate that, uh, and hopefully that will gain pace now in the next few weeks as we move towards the planning phase, yeah. because there will be children who will need to have access to devices, or be given devices or lent devices now in the next few weeks, so that September isn't an extension of, of but, this but that, but that, Yeah, but that's my point. You know, in no way was my question seeking to undermine or underplay the role of teaching staff. It, it, it is purely about the resource that's available in a given household and the variable that there is there. That's the problem, I, I think, in terms of going forward in the very final part of your answer, I think, plays, plays into that. Yeah. Well, part, I mean, we, we had found out last week that um, CGK have been able to source a reduced um, price Chromebook for um, schools to access, but there are still questions about you know, how that can be paid for, um, the logistics of that, whether there's a supply chain issue there. But uh, it's certainly something that school leaders are very concerned about and very keen to ensure that there is a bit more equality um, if those devices can be procured and we can get some guidance on that. That's something we'd be anxious to, work, to, to move on quite quickly. Chairman, Chairman, I have other questions, but I think to be fair to get everyone in, I'm, I'm happy to move on. Thank you. Thanks, William. Catherine? Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you all for your comprehensive submission to the committee this morning. It's very useful in identifying many of the difficulties um, that need to be addressed um, to facilitate a safe and orderly return to school. Um, it's clear that there are huge challenges ahead and that disruption to the curriculum is not just about the current lockdown, but it will continue for months and maybe years to come. Um, in particular, I welcome um, your recognition of the need to allocate pain to identify and address the emotional well-being of pupils, many of whom will have faced different difficult challenges during this lockdown. Is there any additional training that you think teachers and support staff would find beneficial to help them, um, for example, to promote emotional well-being and to deal with any stress and anxiety amongst pupils? Anyone wish to respond? I don't want to hog the airways. I was waiting for one of my colleagues to come in there. Um, but I've already mentioned, Catherine, the, the uh, importance of having a counselling service that is responsive and is extended from post-primary right down into primary. Um, I know there's a huge lobby from the post uh, primary principals groups at the moment to um, get that enabled. It's something that some schools... The, the more affluent schools are able to buy in at the moment, but that just increases the inequality in the system. So it should be something that all primary schools have access to. And the, the level of counselling or the access to counselling in terms of a time allocation in some post primary schools is, is fairly low. So, you know, if we are looking at emotional health and wellbeing and we are wanting to be a responsive system, well, then let's, let's put the investment in there. Um, and make it make it available um, as soon as we need it, which will be in September, October time. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. I agree. That's me, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Justin. You know what? I'd not further to add. That's sorry, fine. sorry, sorry. Apologies, Justin McNulty. <laughs> the other Justin. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks, Justin, Mark. Jerry, Jackie, and uh, Mark, your, your presentation has been was very interesting and enlightening and almost inspiring at a point, so thank you for that. And firstly, I want to applaud the unions and uh, to all of you, the leaders of your, of your unions, for the response to this COVID-19 crisis. Um, your CAM and the CAM of all your teachers uh, with the can-do attitude in these extraordinarily challenging circumstances, which has been a brilliant example for everyone and especially for, for school children. I think not many... Uh, sectors of our society have been reconfigured and disrupted as much as the teaching um, and schools uh, sector. So, listen, well done and, and keep going and we get through this. Um, guidance on pupil reporting was issued today by the department. The minister was agree has agreed to significantly reduce the, the prescribed reporting requirements and provide a temporary legislative basis that will enable principals to decide the content and format of reports. What are your responses or what's your thoughts around that guidance issued by the department today? Uh, is, uh, just another question here. Uh, we, we think um, it's welcome that they've issued guidance, but they've taken an awful long time uh, to do it. Uh, many schools have already 
uh, issued reports. And ultimately, all we have got back is, well, principals use their own judgment in terms of what's needed. I mean, that could have been done uh, two months ago. We, we had asked for this guidance some time ago, so I was Jerry again to the NHC. Um, we'd asked for this guidance um, urgently because <clears throat> we're aware that, <coughs> excuse me, this is report time for schools, and we didn't want um, school our teachers and school leaders um, preparing reports uh, unnecessarily if the need for reporting could have been waived under the COVID legislation. We understand that the, the guidance has been relaxed and that there is a discretionary um, piece out there at the moment. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, many schools will have already completed reports, and then that, again, introduces a variation into the system. So it is a pity it took, it took a while to get it. Yeah, if I could just, as Jagger, from you to you, if I could just pick up on that, because, as Jerry quite rightly says, many schools have, have moved forward, and they were waiting for the guidance. Um, but the, the, the thing is that they, they were moving forward on the basis that they weren't entirely sure what they were going to be asked for. So just... To, to reiterate what Justin said, if that level of guidance had come through earlier, I think teachers would have felt much more confident moving forward. But there is, what they have done is within that guidance anyway. But it just would have been nice to have the, the purity of the, the guidance at that point. In terms of the, the discretionary element of that reporting, um, is that going to cause problems between schools, between families, between communities? What are your thoughts? Well, Justin, um, the, I suppose the key thing here is that um, schools cannot report in any uh, examination results and there can't be any assessment elements. So, you know, the, the report this year will, will have to be, you know, a past, of a pastoral nature, um, as, as much of a progress report as can be mustered with what um, teachers have at their disposal. But the emphasis, I think, should be on keeping it brief and keeping it um, real, realistic um, and not asking too much of people at the moment because the, <clears throat> the workload in terms of uh, supplying remote learning for teachers is huge. Um, I don't think that it's well understood out there, just exactly the amount of preparation and work that goes into um, putting work up for, for children, young people, and then the marking of it. And, uh, you know, some, some, a lot of teachers and school leaders are working very long hours. So if the report is to be a lengthy piece, well then that work will have to be set aside for a period. So I think there needs to be a balance struck. Um, and the usefulness of a report this year um, will be, I think, uh, maximised if it's pastoral in nature. Okay. Okay. Thank I you. I think, sorry, I think also in terms of the um, discrepancies between schools, um, and I know it's just very um, anecdotal as opposed to being scientific, but when we had asked members generally about what they felt should be included in reports, I mean, the teachers right across the board were suggesting the same sorts of things. I think they were aware that they had to report within the confines of this new situation. So as Jerry says, pastoral, um, pastoral issues and what they could you know, state with confidence about the children, mostly before the schools closed. So I think there actually will be a fair amount of uniformity just simply because teachers have brought their professional judgment to bear on that and the principals. Okay. Thank you. In relation to a phased return to schools uh, reopening, um, and it's something that will impact every sector of society in terms of childcare. Childcare is going to play a really, really important role in terms of kick-starting and rebooting our society. Have the teachers union any knowledge of the role the childcare sector will play in terms of how many teachers have, for example, a spouse or a partner who is also a teacher and whose access to childcare will be essential to allow them to return to the classroom? That's just, sorry, here. Uh, we have no real uh, information on that, but if schools reopen, it's going to be quite clear that teachers themselves are key workers. And their preschool age children are going to have to be prioritised in, uh, in, in any plan, otherwise schools themselves won't be able to reopen. Yeah, yeah Justin, um, you make a good point, um, but it's back to what we said earlier, that um, there are a lot of things that need to dovetail in order for schools to open even in a, in a phased way. Um, so obviously ch uh, teachers with um, preschool age children are indeed children up to um, whatever ages uh, who, are, who are not back at school will need to be home in a childcare capacity. So 
all of that needs to dovetail and other agencies need to be working towards a resumption of normal practice at the same time as schools. Okay, Justin, uh, time, time time for, sorry, just time for one, one very concise final question, Justin, and then I need to move to Morris to finish. Okay, to, to what extent are you confident or otherwise that all the health and safety measures necessary are being adopted or implemented by the department to ensure that your members and all pupils can return to school safely? Good question. Who wants to respond? Well, this, this is Jackie from UTU. I think we're actually, as, as it was referenced earlier about the, the ongoing engagements that we have with, um, with the Department and the Employing Authority, and I think we're actually at the beginning of that process of establishing what the concerns are for um, teachers and principals and going back into some sort of different form of school um, and making sure we have the necessary, um, whether it's practical equipment or, or whether it's just procedures and processes in place. So um, that confidence will hopefully build as we move forward because we're, we're at the beginning of that engagement process around that. Okay, thanks, Justin. Morris, final question. Is Morris there? No. Right. Okay. Uh, members, thank you very much indeed for your questions. Uh, Justin, Mark, Jerry, Jackie uh, and Mark, thanks very much indeed for your contribution today and indeed for the, the written briefings that you've provided us. You, you are, um, as always, making some extremely constructive suggestions on behalf of your membership with regards to how we do um, that phased expansion of school opening um, in, a, in a safe and child-centred way um, that ensures the safety of staff and uh, children and that ensures we deliver the curriculum in a, in a flexible way. Um, I don't have time to ask any further questions, but um, Mark Langhammer, I found the suggestion with regards to inspection and improvement, potentially taking a renewed focus on inspecting and supporting pedagogies for blended school and distance learning, a, a useful suggestion and maybe something that we can follow up in due course. But thank, thank you again for all the work that you are doing and, and your members are doing for um, our education sector at this time and we look forward to ongoing engagement with you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members then, um, I'll ask the clerk to come in at the end of our next session and uh, move to agenda item six, which is our Department of Education coronavirus response uh, oral briefing. Uh, refer members to briefing paper from the clerk at page 57, correspondence from substitute teachers on COVID-19 and hardship issues at page 146, and refer members to table papers which include the latest Department of Education COVID-19 situation report and other correspondence from substitute teachers. Can I confirm that I have Derek Baker, Permanent Secretary for the Department of Education? Yes, yes, Chair. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm here with the Minister as well, the Minister for Education. Okay, you're, you're very welcome, Minister. And I think John Smith, Deputy Secretary of the Department of Education as well. Is that, is that right, Derek? Uh, well, he's not with me, Chair. That's okay. I, That's okay. <laughs> we wish, wish John well. Okay. Um, Derek, uh, Minister, would you like to make any opening remarks? Well, yeah, I mean, briefly, uh, I suppose a lot of stuff is covered in our, our update to the committee, and I suppose there's a range of issues which are work in progress. Obviously, probably the most significant elements that have happened um, since the last levels of briefing, and again, you get slightly sort of um, overtaken by... Oh, sorry, yeah, hold on, hold on a second. Yeah, you give me a second or so, uh, just I think it's probably I wasn't a bit close enough to the microphone. Okay, okay. Uh, Sorry, uh, okay, sorry, let me start again. Okay. Um, Chair, it's, uh, I, I suppose that this way, there's, while obviously a lot of detail is contained within the uh, update to the committee, uh, I suppose there's always a slight danger of um, losing track of what, is, what has happened in what time frame in terms of some of the elements of work in progress. But I suppose in terms of recent events, uh, probably the most significant element, uh, obviously, and I know that uh, you'd indicated, which obviously we have had as well, considerable level of correspondence in terms of substitute teacher issue. Uh, obviously, having tried various routes to get that uh, resolved, 
uh, and obviously, it obviously highlighted to the, the committee at an earlier stage that um, if it was simply the department jumping in to try and provide a solution themselves, they wouldn't be able to be as comprehensive as if we got a, a level of, of assistance. Uh, there was obviously agreement then in terms of the executive on the establishment of a fund, um, which uh, there's a £12 million, £8 million coming from uh, the department, £4 million centrally from the, the executive COVID fund. Uh, we've actually already been able to set up the, the work in connection with that. It's on the website. Um, I think we had around about 1,200 uh, initial responses from substitute teachers. It's a fairly, uh, I would say, as application form school, it's probably one of the, uh, the most straightforward, I think, that, that um, is there. Um, in terms of, obviously, as part of this as well, and we'll hopefully try to put a bit more flesh in the bones fairly soon on this, um, the executive obviously has produced its overall strategy for recovery. Um, contained within that is specifically the situation as regards schools and the step-by-step -step approach um, in connection with that. I hope uh, very shortly to be able to bring a more detailed paper to the executive and be able to touch on some of those issues, again, depending upon what the executive said, uh, hopefully maybe in the ad hoc statement uh, tomorrow. Uh, obviously, as well, has been indicated um, on a range of other issues, obviously in terms of school reports, we've been in a position to give clarity. It has been a complex subject because it does require, uh, it's not just a question of guidance or um, giving, if you like, a memo from the department, but obviously it requires, it's, it's subject to legal procedure, it's subject to the fact that um, from that, that point of view, uh, you know, it, it, there are, is legislation in place which uh, requires certain things. Hopefully that, that will have given a level of flexibility to schools and ease the potential burden on a range of other issues uh, such as the interdisciplinary teams in terms of vulnerable children. Uh, as you'll see from the report, there are specific dates in each of the trust areas those are beginning to have met. And I suppose there's a wide range of other things which are continuing in terms of, of uh, uh, work in progress. Uh, uh, in particular, I suppose, starting to do uh, levels of engagement at a range of levels uh, with stakeholders, and obviously there's been mentioned that we're at the start of a process uh, with um, particularly, say, the trade unions and with schools on how we, how we look at uh, the phasing of um, uh, the, the reopening, and obviously that will be uh, part, of, part of that as well. So there's, what's that? Yeah, and obviously in terms of, uh, as we indicated previously, there's, there is in terms of IT distribution, uh, obviously we've got a three-stage, three-pronged uh, process which is in terms of the scoping out and then uh, effectively the reprofiling and handing out of, of what IT equipment is there within the system. There's the, uh, the, uh, the element that EA have already put on procurement that will soon be arriving in. And then as part of that, uh, then there will be a level of budget be provided for additional um, IT equipment. Because, you know, I think whatever the shortages are there, it's not something that, that in terms of the process of remote learning that is expected to be over within a few weeks. So this is part of a longer term process. You seem, you seem uh, Chair, it may just, may just be the connection we're getting here. It seems, seems very broken. Any, any sign we're getting back here seems very broken up. No, you're, 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 uh, I'm hearing you reasonably clear today, Minister. That, that's okay. Just, there, may, there may be a bit of interference from somebody else's. I don't know, but I, I can hear you, Chair, perfectly well. Yeah, no, uh, you're, you're coming across reasonably clear today, Minister. Um, if you're happy to take questions then. You're, yes. you're, you're, you're quite clear. There's a bit of an echo, Minister, but I'm happy about that because when you mention money, it automatically doubles. <laughs> <laughs> if only, if only, if only that, that was true in real life. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been an awful lot easier for, for the department. Okay, Minister, we'll, we'll move to questions and, and thank you for your, your opening remarks. Um, at, at last week's committee meeting, um, the impact of, of lockdown on preparations for the uh, non-statutory post-primary transfer tests um, was raised and uh, members expressed uh, concern with the proposed delay of two to three weeks. Um, I personally have been inundated with correspondence um, stating that uh, it's unfair to require children to sit tests in November and December and indeed um, significant correspondence from parents who find your, your welcome of the two week delay as out of touch with their concerns. Um, can, I, can I ask what specific actions have been taken to consult with primary schools and selective schools 
uh, to scope any contingency for the transfer tests? Well, from the point of view of selective schools, selective schools, largely speaking, are working very closely. Obviously, there, there has been uh, contact at various stages. They are working, obviously, very closely, particularly with the, the organisations that are setting the test. And I think it's, it's, it's also the case that any particular alternative action that could be considered by anyone will have implications for both primary and post-primary schools. Largely speaking, I suppose, the, the position is the same. I should also say as well, on foot of the remarks that were made yesterday, I had a direct conversation with, with Archbishop Martin on the, on the subject that thought it was important to, to hear his views. Look, essentially, I suppose this still comes down to three questions and three positions. Uh, first of all, whether academic selection is used at all, uh, and I appreciate there is a divergence of opinion on that. You know, we could debate that probably until, uh, uh, you know, for years to come. But clearly that is both legal and indeed I, I would be supportive of the right of schools to use academic selection. The second issue then is if academic selection is to be used for at least some schools, and ultimately it's up to the choice of school, schools as what criteria they use, it is then whether that is done by way of test or whether it's done by some other procedure. It is abundantly clear that in terms of, if we're looking at fairness uh, and indeed providing a good solution for people, it is undoubtedly the case test that a test is preferable to any other method of academic information. You know, in terms of assessment that is there, uh, the only other available information um, is basically for the cohort that would be entering P7 next year uh, would be the, the P5 tests. Of those, those are of a nature that are done quite differently between schools. There is no common comparison in, in relation to that. Uh, and consequently, those would not be a particularly robust way of, of moving forward. So it seems fairly clear that if, uh, the, if, if data is to be used for academic selection, um, that that simply is not there in a form which would be satisfactory to be able to use that. The, the alternative of academic selection is to be used by way of some form of teacher assessment. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I suspect, I don't know whether it was put to the, the trade unions or not, I, I would think very clearly would not find favour with teachers. It would again be a less robust system. And also to work, as indicated, would require the full support of, um, of every school sort of participating. Finally, then, I suppose, there's the issue of timing. And I can entirely understand people's concerns in terms of timing. Um, now, I think there's a wider issue of how we provide support, particularly for, uh, for key years uh, re-entering uh, the, the school system. I make a slight differentiation because people have said, sometimes implied that education has stopped since March. That is not the case. There has been continued remote learning. It's not as good as necessarily being there in the classroom, but it has continued. The issue in terms of timing, and I understand people's nervousness around this, is that in terms of an exercise between the results being made available um, and the, uh, a final placement in which then uh, can take place, would mean that once appeals are taken into consideration, and it is likely, given circumstances, there will be a lot more appeals this year than previous years, would mean that for a range of, of, um, uh, of students, they would not know what school they were going into until, um, until October. Um, Chair, if, if excuse, I actually, there's, a, there's an urgent call on personal matter I've got to take. I'm, I'm, I'll hand you over to the, uh, to the permanent secretary for a moment, okay? Okay. Permanent Secretary? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm here. Yes, Chair. Uh, I'll maybe return to those uh, questions with the Minister when he returns. I, I presume that's a short, urgent call? I, I have no idea, uh, Chair. I'm sorry, but uh, obviously it popped up on his phone, so he's just left the room momentarily. Okay, I'll let you know. I, would, I would like to return to those questions with him. Hang on, hang on. The minister, sorry, just, yeah, minister. sorry, sorry, apologies. Uh, it's the, the, nature, the, nature, the nature of the phone call, I had to take it, but I, I actually had to put the person off call for a while. I'll yeah, maybe explain it at a different, at a different time in, yes, in relation no, to that. No, no need so to look, explain, look, Minister. Uh, look, it, 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 is, it is also the case that, I mean, as well having spoken indeed, one of the things that the Archbishop clarified was that he, he expressed, used the, the term cruel, and indicated that what he thought was creating uncertainty for, uh, for pupils, for parents, was cruel. Uh, and clearly, I think as much 
clarity as we can give, as much uh, certainty as we can give, I think is the right way. And if, if we're going to be in a situation where we're simply saying it might be this or it might be that, I think that is not something which would be helpful to, uh, to pupils or parents or staff. Okay, and what equality impact assessment has been completed on the setting of tests this year in the current context? Well, we don't we don't set the test. It's not strictly speaking from that point of view. We can give we can give advice on transfer process in terms of what can be processed in whatever time frame. Anything, but it, this, these aren't as indicated. We all individually will have views in this. But these are not our tests, so any responsibility for a quality impact, and it's not being set by a public body in that regard. So that would be, I suppose, more you could direct that at AQE or PPTC, but it's not our decision, so we can't we can't call the impact somebody else's decision. Okay, what is your assessment of the equality impact of completing tests this year? Well, it affects it clearly affects uh, all children, uh, but. I suppose, if you like, if I was if I was someone who was simply doing a quality impact assessment, that's where my particular qualifications would be. Uh, I'm not qualified for that, so therefore I've ended up as Minister for Education instead. What, what's your assessment of the extent to which pupils are experiencing distance learning differently? I, I think it's Michael, I'll, I'll pass over perhaps the Department Secretary exactly wants to say something just directly on that. Well, I mean, if you're still in the Sorry, Chair, Derek here. If you're, still in the, if you're still in the sphere of a quality impact assessment, I'm not too sure how that question is relevant. Um, how would a different Section 75 group be affected by that? We're not talking... Uh, disadvantage is not a Section 75 group. Okay, so what... Pardon, <laughs> Secretary, then, given, given that the Minister has passed to you, what is, what is your assessment of the extent to which pupils are experiencing distance learning differently? Well, of course there are differences out there. I know that the committee has had a detailed briefing on distance learning, or maybe is about to have a detailed briefing. Um, as the Minister has said, it is far from ideal that schools are closed. It's anything but ideal, and we would much rather that they are not closed. Um, it is inevitable that the experiences of children will be different, because it is impossible to have uniformity across 1,000 schools out there when you're engaged in distance learning. The system was never set up for distance learning. That's an inevitability. But in terms of Section 75 or a quality impact assessment, I really am not sure that that comes into it. Okay, I, well, we can, we can move on from that. Minister, Minister okay. can, I, can I ask you, do, do you believe that children have equal opportunity to prepare for tests in an equitable manner? Well, so, well uh, as best, best they can be, I mean, look, there will always be some levels of inequalities within society. I, I've taken whatever action I can, indeed, even in the previous bit, to try and create a level, level playing field. Can you, as much as possible? And so, for instance, a, a previous um, memo, if you like, from the department saying that, that they were, the department was effectively, from the previous minister, forbidding schools to help any level of preparation has been taken off. That choice is there, therefore, for schools. Can there be entirely equality between every family in Northern Ireland as to how they approach this or what resources they can apply to it? That is the same, I think, for, unfortunately, for any exam situation as well. And so, for example, even those, for instance, who will be doing GCSEs or A-levels, there will be some families, because of economic advantage, for instance, will, will have a level of private tuition uh, that will be in that. That, that is not something, ultimately, that, that could be stopped. We can try and make sure that as much equality is there within, within the system. Mention has been made, for example, as we move ahead, to try to make sure that there's as full access in terms of remote learning as possible. I, I heard, I only caught the tail end of the, the position from the unions, and I thought, which is something that is already happening, for instance, Mark Langhammer suggested that in terms of the inspectorate, that a lot of their concentration should be on remote learning and the, uh, the pedagogy of, of that and support from that. That, that is actually the direction of travel and the actions that are getting taken by the inspectorate. So as, as much as possible, we're trying to ensure that, that what is provided on distance learning, and you'll get a sort of a wider, there will be a wider brief on that, uh, is as equal as possible. But is everything absolutely equal between everybody? No, I don't, think, I don't think that is the case. Unfortunately, we don't live 
in that sort of ideal world. All we can do is try to take steps to make that level of uh, of um, equalisation as much as possible. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, Minister, but you, you can't equate routine inequality with uh, months of lockdown due to a global health emergency, but I'll, I'll move on from that. My final question in relation to this is, every other stage of the coronavirus recovery plan is not calendar-led, but specific dates have been set for these transfer tests. Why? Well, again, first of all, first of all, ultimately, well, because, you know, people will need, first of all, I suppose the direct absolute choice comes to the organisations themselves. But secondly, because there is a knock-on effect that unless you, have a, unless you have a transfer process which then enables pupils for next year to transfer into uh, September uh, 2021 to their new schools, you know, there, is, there is no point saying this will happen at some point in the future. In precisely the same way that in terms of timescales, we have striven within the existing side of things to ensure that Preschool transfer happens on a particular date in terms of information. Post primary, sorry, primary transfer happens, and that indeed the, there is a specific time scale for post primary this year, which, okay, because of I think postage will, will be delayed a day or two, but more or less is on time. Those are specific dates. We have not said, frankly, because of coronavirus, this could be at some stage in the future. And again, part of the stuff is as much as possible, we need to give people certainty. And I think that that, is, that must be a, a considerable driver as much as possible. Okay, so just, just to finish, um, you're not aware of any contingency plan f to tests that is being <laughs> scoped by selective schools then? Well, again, that, that would be an issue for the, the selective schools. Okay. But, you know, what I'm saying is that in terms of data that is there, there is not a level of robust data. It is also the case that if you're going to assess someone, a test is the best possible way of doing it. And for example, it would be very freely acknowledged by CCEA that we've had put specific position in place for this year's regards to the GCSE, A2 and A level. But they would be the, obviously the first to say that is, that is a least worst option substitute for what is the best option, which is pupils getting, getting grades and marks on the basis of them doing the direct test in the time that they should be doing them. If, if as you say, you use academic selection for transfer. That, that's all for me, Minister. Well, that, I... that, that, that's yeah. obviously like a, an initial, initial situation. Clearly, oh. if academic selection wasn't used, but there is legally the right to use it, I support the school's right to use it. If academic selection isn't used, there still then needs to be some suggestion about how over sub subscribed schools would actually determine which pupils get into it and which, and which don't. It isn't used for primary school admissions? Uh, and with respect on it, uh, you will find that, that, broadly speaking, well, first of all, you couldn't really use academic selection, you'd think, for four-year-olds. I think that's into the slightly element of, of the ridiculous, to be perfectly honest on it. But look, we clearly agree with you for ten-year-olds as well. Um, can well I, can and, with, and, with, and with respect to the oversubscribed schools, now, if we don't, my, look, my personal view is, if we don't have some form of academic selection, you will see developing a system, largely speaking, that happens in England, where there will be a cadre of schools that will effectively be private schools selecting on the basis of the ability of fee payers to pay. Now, there are inequalities within the current system. If you want to exacerbate those, move to a system which selection happens by way of the ability of people to pay for places to be to enter that. Or alternatively, where schools select on the basis of, of proximity, where uh, there is a premium price then on who can get a, a, a house closest to that particular high regarded school. Or indeed in England, where certain schools that are church based will require particular levels of attendance at, at particular church services. Now, you know, none of those seem to be particularly attractive uh, notions, but that, you know, to some extent, there's, there's a debate maybe for a, for a, a longer yeah. and wider day. Probably is. Even, even if there was universe consensus on moving in a particular direction, yeah. you know, this is not something, realistically, which could ever happen in an overnight phase. It would have to be okay. something that would have to be done okay. uh, with probably a year or two's planning. Okay. There are, there are obviously other non-selective systems other than England, but yeah, as you say, we need to bring other members in. So, Deputy Chairperson, uh, Karen Moe. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you, Minister and Derek. 
I'm going to keep this as short and concise as I can because we're under like pressure for time. So I'll just go go through it in the one go, and maybe Minister, if you want to come on at the end. Um, we heard from the unions this morning there around the return to school and the huge level of concern and anxiety. Um, and the many areas that we need to plan and prepare for, which I know yourself and your department has started. It's really important that all stakeholders must be included in that and that parents and young people are involved in that engagement from the start and that also must start now. Um, I want to thank you and the executive for securing the funds for sub-teachers. Uh, I raised this morning with the unions. I believe the first payment is to be made on the 16th of June and I understand that that is to do with the department's pay run but I would appeal to you that it is too long three months, nearly three months without payment. And I would ask that if you can look at shortening that window and also move on the pay settlement that is, is there for them, um, if that could be put in place. In relation to free school meals, I would ask, if you haven't already, that your department continues to work with community uh, minister and ours um, and to look at providing the free school meal payment over the summer payment over the summer period, um, and I'm just going to finish on this point. I'm not sure if it can be it can be answered today, but I would like to see maybe some detail. I'd be interested to know just in the discussion that has been happening over the last couple of weeks in relation to the selection test. If the primary school curriculum here for primary six and primary seven has now gone out the window in our education system, if teachers are now actively teaching for this un unregulated test. Um, they allow some of our schools to select our children, um, and maybe we could see the, you know, be provided with some detail on that uh, further down the line. Thank you, Minister. Oh, okay, thank, thank you, Karen. I'll try and, I'll try and deal with a few of those those issues, um, and then I think the permanent secretary is going to deal directly with the, the payments issues as regards uh, the substitute teacher side of it. Um, just in terms of curriculum, um, the, the position is that there is no bar on schools helping to prepare uh, pupils, but it's on the basis of the, the curriculum continuing and indeed, you know, it's not, I suppose, to be fair in terms of what even comes through the test. This is something that is left field to, to the curriculum. So there's no particular change because of the testing, the P6 and P7. I, I think what may well have to be considered, and I think will be considered across the board in a range of jurisdictions, and we've got to make sure that something is broadly speaking compatible, is to what extent if we move into the autumn and we move into still what is likely to be a level of mixture of direct teaching within schools and remote learning, to what extent will there have to be some level of adjustment to the curriculum to take account of that? And that's, I think, something that will have to be, to be scoped out. I know from conversations with uh, my opposite numbers in, in other jurisdictions last night, you know, that, that is part of a wider thing that will have to be, to be looked at. Um, as well, but there's no there's no direct impact on the curriculum because of uh, of tests in relation to that. Um, look, you make a very valid point in terms of scoping out on the range of issues and a range of stakeholders. Um, I want to have that as as broadly as possible. That's why I think we are trying to take our time to cut through um, some of those issues. Obviously, there'll be a very direct engagement with the unions, but it will go beyond that. So there will be at times groups of principals, teachers. Uh, Parents, and I know I've already done interviews today with, with Parent Time, for instance, um, on some of the issues and trying to get data on that basis, and also directly with, with children. I'm hoping to facilitate, uh, have facilitated fairly shortly a um, sort of a question and answer session with, with people trying to get, if you like, firsthand what, what their views are. So there'll be a very wide range of stakeholders that will be taken into account. Obviously, as well, directly outside the educational sphere of things. Will, will also be what the guidance will be, uh, both medically and from, the, uh, and from a scientific point of view. So, uh, you know, some of the key issues which will be asked, and also then the practical implications of that. So, I, I'm not going to give, I'm not going to attempt an answer to this, but you know, what will be necessary, for example, in terms of PPE? What will be necessary in terms of hygiene? What will be necessary in terms of testing, for instance? What will be necessary in terms of social distancing? And whereas there's a key role with, with the educational stakeholders in that, there's clear input going to have to be put in from the, the medical side of that. Because if you take something to the issue of PPE, uh, it may be that, that some people will say they don't believe it'd be, uh, you know, particular levels that they would need it for their school. But it may well be that, that 
that that would somehow have to be accepted. It may also be that, that some people will say, well, we need X, Y, and Z, but the medical experts will say, well, actually, you only really need X. You know, those will all be yeah. things that will have to be spoken ahead. Thankfully, a bit of time in relation to it. Uh, on the free school move, before I pass on to Gary, yeah, look, uh, we are continuing to work with communities. However, what, what I would say, and I, I want to be absolutely realistic in this, um, both the normal departmental budget, there is not money for free school meals from the department over the summer period. Realistically, there's not. And it is unlikely um, that certainly from that point of view that there will be uh, the, the, the amount of COVID resource within the department, sorry, within the um, executive is such that at the moment we're moving to a position of overcommitment before even anything could be considered, for instance, the summer. So the executive as a whole will need to take a view on that. But in terms of continuation of payments, it's certainly not something that can be done by the Department of Education and being entirely frank and honest. There simply isn't the money available. Now, where I think there is a challenge, the Department of Communities has overall responsibility and taken up a responsibility for uh, the feeding of vulnerable um, families. I think that's where the focus of work is likely to be. Um, if there's practical assistance that we can give, and for instance, there's already been work that has happened with the, the youth service, uh, then you know, we'll be more than happy to cooperate, but it really ultimately lies in the Department of Communities because there is not, there will not be the money to be able to do it from within the Department of Education. I'll pass on to Derek just as regards the, the issue on the subject teacher in terms of the payment process. Okay, Karen. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that I, I didn't hear your engagement with the teaching unions. Obviously, we've been talking to them about this. They know that we do have a payroll to pay uh, substitute teachers. Like all payrolls, it runs on a cycle. You process all the changes, you lock it down, you run the pay. So um, we hope to get all of the applications in for the month in respect of April and May by uh, next Tuesday, the 26th of May. Then we will process, then we will run the payroll. Those staff who are dealing with this up in Waterside House, they're dealing with the day job that is the normal pay, for which there are thousands of changes each month. On top of that, those same staff are dealing with the two years of back pay that we've just negotiated and agreed with the trade unions to get that into June pay. Now we are asking those staff to process a brand new bespoke scheme for substitute teachers. I am not going to ask those staff to come in and do manual processing and writing of checks or the substitute teacher scheme on top of all of those other things they're doing, they would all fall over. They're working remotely, which is really difficult because these are secure remote systems for pay and pensions, and that of itself is a massive challenge to do the day job, let alone the back pay, let alone the uh, substitute teacher's pay, Karen. So it comes down to an issue of capacity. It's just not doable unless I ask staff in Waterside House work 24-7, seven days a week. They are already working really, really hard, and I'm not going to ask them to do that. Okay. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Derek. And I just want to, sorry, Chair, I just wanted to come on. I also want to thank the staff at Waterside House. I have been told of the great work that they're doing by ours. Um, so it's great to hear, particularly here locally in my own city. I oh, commend yeah. them. Obviously, Karen, all, 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 all politics is local, Karen, in that regard. Exactly. I, I'm actually just following on some of the other committee members and letting them know how this works, Minister. Uh, but I also want to say to you, Derek, we should always be looking at ways of how we can do it. And sometimes it may be putting on extra resource or extra support to be able to do it. And what I, will, what I am highlighting to you here today, and I know others probably will, is this nearly takes a Sunday an hour a month. And people are really dire at the moment. And what I was just asking, if there was a way of getting it out any quicker and for you to look at those options, well, I said quite aware that I wouldn't want to be putting uh, that pressure on, on ours. But could so, we look at getting it out? So we, maybe someone we, can look at So I understand that. Look, things can always be looked at, but we're also very careful that we don't, we don't want to give false expectations to people, to be honest. I think the critical element, look, and there is no doubt, I, I'm very acutely aware of the dire position that a lot of substitute teachers have been in. Obviously, the department and myself have been trying to get a resolution to this, and we've eventually got this, found the solution this week, which would be able to provide that. I suppose, uh, while there may still be a, a level of frustration over the timing, 
what we've been able to give this week is absolute certainty to people. Uh, the scheme is, fr is pretty straightforward from that point of view. So it is not a question of people thinking they're going to get X and end up getting Y. So there will be absolute certainty of, of payment, and people will get will get paid fully. That that uh, according to the, the scheme. And the other thing is, can I mean, the application process is pretty simple and straightforward. It is just basic information they're asking for because we hold all of the data. And um, as of I can let you know, as of this morning, we already had twelve hundred successful applications successfully lodged with us. We estimate that might be out of a total of 3,800. So I think we're well underway getting all the eligible applications in by next Tuesday, hopefully. Um, but, but Karen, the only way, without distorting or reconfiguring our payroll, which I would not be prepared to do because it's such high risk, would be bringing staff in, manually writing checks, taking them off a job, and uh, potentially creating a risk for both the back pay award being paid out in June and the normal run of the pay for the 20,000 teachers out there who are still paying. Doing all three things simultaneously is a massive challenge in its own right, but we're going to do that. But doing anything over and above that, I just don't think is deliverable. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Can I bring in Robin Newton? Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank the Minister and, and uh, Mr. Baker for attending today uh, again. Uh, I'd like just to build on a, a question from the, uh, raised by the Deputy Chair in School Mills, but indeed to perhaps ask you, Minister, to look at the Eat Well, Live Well uh, programme. It, it, it is obviously to have a, a healthy breakfast, a healthy lunch, um, is absolutely critical in the maintenance of the, the body and, and indeed hopefully in a learning uh, situation. And you had allocated, Chair, sorry, you had allocated, uh, Minister, 400k for the uh, that service, which indeed touched very quickly 2,000 uh, young people. But indeed we know that uh, from your report that there were 3,100 who were registered uh, an interest in lack of food via the youth online. You made the remarks during the report, uh, Minister, in the report that um, through food banks, DFC and local councils and other community-based responses, you're hoping that uh, that scheme uh, can, can be continued as your budget has now been exhausted. Can I just put it to you, Minister, there needs to be some sort of coordination around that so that the 2,000 young people who did avail of it, and indeed the balance who weren't able to avail of it, are actually being able to secure some breakfast and uh, lunches during the course of the week. Uh, Robin, we're, we're, we are sort of continuing in dialogue with, with the FC in relation to that. I, I should point out that whenever we refer to the 3,100, those are 3,100 children who availed of the service rather than simply applied on that, on that basis. What I would also indicate as part of that is, uh, again, highlighting the overall um, issue of responsibility in terms of vulnerable families will be for DFC. So we are highlighting the range of stakeholders that will need to be engaged within this. What I would say is, again, just to, to uh, it may sound a little bit pedantic, but whenever we're talking about 400,000 being allocated, that wasn't from within the department's budget. This was specifically money that the executive voted through for a period of time for a certain amount of support. Now, that will, I, I think, if, it's, if we're looking ahead, and there needs to be a package put together by communities, that would have to be part, part of that. But that was specific executive money for a specific time frame, rather than Department of Education money on, on that basis. Okay, thank you, Chair. And can I ask you, Minister, then, in terms of the coordination of that between DFC and uh, youth service, food banks, local councils, is there a strategy to 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 ensure that that happens? Well, look, we're, we're we're working closely. I think look, the, the overarching responsibility lies with DFC, but we're certainly in fairly constant contact with DFC yeah. in relation to it. We, we can't call the shots on it, if you like, because it's not, in that sense, uh, the broad sort of 
support for vulnerable people is not on our bit, but we're inputting very heavily in, in constant contact with DFC on that basis, and also EA, obviously, with them as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, Chair, I'm, I'm content Thanks, with that. Thank you. Daniel McCrossan. Daniel, you're on mute. Yes, Chair. All right, thanks. Go ahead. Sorry, I was on the phone to the doctor there, Chair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 I had to take that call. Uh, sorry. M Minister, first of all, uh, uh, yourself and Derek, I want to just put on record my appreciation and thanks for uh, the uh, efforts that were made in coming to the conclusion and uh, reaching the conclusion of, of, of the 12 million, which is uh, very important for so many, as you know. It comes as a huge relief, and the reaction to that announcement yesterday shows just how important it was and, and how many were struggling through at this time. So I know that you were trying behind the scenes, and, and uh, Derek was very keen to get it off the table last week, and I'm glad now that it is. So I'm just wondering. Uh, when uh, the funds will be ruled out. It's probably touched on there when I was on the phone. But. No, I, I, Daniel, it's, it's, uh, I think Derek explained quite reasonably comprehensively the card. It will be, it's part of the next uh, pay run. Uh, the, the applications are now coming in. We anticipate that they should be complete by about Tuesday. Indeed, we got in terms of the first 24 hours, 1,200 applications. It will be part of the overall, the, the payroll run up and so the 16th of June will be the date in which payment is, is made. Yeah. Now, that's not ideal, but it gives people absolute certainty and it means then the payroll people will be dealing with that. They'll also be dealing with the normal activities of the normal pay for teachers and also the implementation of the back pay uh, side of things on that, on that basis. Um, I mean, I know as well, uh, you're right in terms of the significance of the issue. Particularly, well, and I suspect that maybe some of those who haven't contacted, um, there's a wide range of people that are affected. Some uh, that it's very, very central to. Uh, some maybe more at the periphery of some people who be doing the odd, the odd day here and there. But particularly, I'm acutely aware that for at least a reasonable section of substitute teachers, a lot of these people will be people in their, uh, say, mid-20s through to early 30s. Quite often, them will be of relatively new family responsibilities, will have mortgages to pay. So we were acutely aware of that. Clearly, we'd have, there would have been a desire to get this dealt with sooner. The route, I suppose, um, having initially found that there wasn't sufficient money within the executive as a whole, uh, obviously there was good approaches made with the Department of Finance uh, to Treasury to see if there could be agreement to a furloughing scheme, which would have more or less produced the same amount of money, would have also had the side advantage of it wouldn't have then hit directly the executive or indeed the department's budget. It would enable that money to be spent elsewhere. Uh, although there was very detailed submissions that were made, there was a period, it took a while for the, it to become clear what the position of Treasury was. That was the level of, of delay. And when it became clear that that wasn't something that was going to be allowable under Treasury, uh, then we moved swiftly to that. And there was, I think, very good cooperation of both the Department of Finance and the executive as a whole in bringing, bringing this over the line. But you can appreciate that at various stages, some of those things were work in progress, so we weren't always able to comment on every step of the way, but I'm glad at least there's been a level of, of resolution. Uh, thank, and thank you for, for the clarification, Madam Minister. I'm just wondering uh, as well, uh, does some clash of assistance also fall under the support? No, no it's, it's, it's purely that uh, there for uh, substitute teachers. But again, if a classroom assistant is assigned currently as an employee, currently with a particular child, uh, then they would continue to be getting paid fully on that, on that basis. So the extent to which in other sectors of education, uh, I know the EA, there will be some casual staff at times, but that, that's a much looser arrangement and uh, a much smaller arrangement than, than the substitute teacher. This is purely, uh, it's a very straightforward and simple scheme. It is purely for substitute teachers. And again, I would indicate as well that those who have bookings, and those, for instance, say somebody who's doing a maternity cover throughout the, the spring term, are continuing to be fully paid. It's where there's been that considerable level of drop-off. And there's been a the very occasional bit of, of casual work, but very little. Those who basically experience the drop-off in casual, uh, and I know and that would be seen sometimes with a pejorative term, but in terms of those who would get uh, more uh, short-term bookings, shall we say, it's to cover that that situation specifically for substitute teachers. Okay.
Okay, okay. Daniel, I, I need to move on. Okay. Hello? Oh, oh, okay, Jerry, you cut me short today. Okay, do you, you want a, f a very, very concise final supplementary? I'm, I'm only going to be able to take one question and one supplementary from members here due to time constraints. A final supplementary? Right. Yeah, well, it's just a follow on from a point that we had made last week in relation to the £12 million for key workers. Uh, uh, How is that funding gone to date and have any problems emerged? I'm just wondering, Minister, and I know we've raised this, are five staff sufficient to meet the application demands? Um, do you, do you mean for, long, for, for childcare, yeah, Daniel? Do you mean for childcare? Yes. Yeah, for childcare. Yes, 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 yes. Well, Daniel, there is a bit of an update to what Now, I think where we found, uh, and again, we're continuing to work, it's been administered by BSO. Uh, I suppose where we're continuing to work on it, there's been probably uh, a limited demand on the approved childcare scheme side of it, probably been a much greater level of interest, and I don't know whether that might need to be there, but on the childminders side of it. But we're continuing to work, because there's also been an ongoing issue uh, which will be on two points. One, we're also going to be cognizant of, in terms of the envelope of there, uh, of how we, how we actually approach childcare beyond the end of June and what level of support. And there may well also be something that, that in broad elements of childcare, the executive can do as a whole on that basis on it. Um, you know, so there's, there's that side of things. I'm going to make another point that's just gone out of my head. Daniel, if I can jump in here, it's there is. I mean, the, the progress report gives you the number of applications received. Um, as the Minister says, we've probably got a lot more applications from child finders in than from settings. We meet all the interested parties every day to see how it's going, and the offer of additional resource from this department to business services organisation still stands. Now, they're clear they don't need it. We also have, and I think it might have been recommended by the committee, a reference group involving the statutory partners but also representatives from the provider sector themselves to deal with issues that have emerged. And that's okay. really a great um, touch point to figure out what's happening on the ground. And whilst there are issues and queries arising every day, so far there are no major problems that we are aware of that we're not addressing on a day-by-day -day basis. I, I know one other issue which I think was signaled I think, by the Health Minister last week. I, 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 I think there has been a little bit of friction at times because the, the definition of key worker from the health side has differed, I think to be fair, not just from education, but differed from probably the wider executive definition. And I think in his, his statement to the ad hoc committee uh, last week, the health minister did signal that that was in the process of being changed by health, so that, that health, if you like, would come onto the same playing field as, as everybody else on that basis. I, do, I don't think that's been brought in as yet, but I think that should be there probably by roughly about the end of the month. Need to move, need to move on, gentlemen. But you're right, the, the um, expansion of the key worker definition is going to need to be looked at. Can I bring in Robbie Butler, please? Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Chair. One question and one supplementary. Is that the rule? Yes? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay. Yes, Robbie. And I'm going to prioritise uh, what you were talking to the Chair about, the Assistant okay, Minister. I think you've done marvellously well up to this point, but I couldn't disagree with you more on the lack of flexibility and agility that has been put to the AQE conundrum. Um, I would, uh, there's a comprehensive report that you put in, and I do welcome it. I welcome the data that have been provided. But what is lacking is uh, uh, evidence to show that uh, enough had been done to consider a, 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 longer, um, uh, a longer delay to the test. I think that's still achievable. And I think if we were to be more agile and, uh, and more innovative in how we do this, we could reduce those inequalities that you've accepted exist. Across the, the, the whole, uh, they exist anyway. The chair has very well um, orated his uh, position in terms of inequalities. And I genuinely think we could, this needs to be our number one priority, Minister. Okay, look, uh, uh, Robbie, look, thanks. For, look, we, we, are, we are looking in, uh, again in, in, in detail as whether well, there's any level. I think the, the problem is that transfer tends to be, it is quite a complex process. I think, albeit there's some of these overlapping, um, the timeframes were developed in relation to each of the elements of this. Albeit a couple of these overlapping, I think from the point at which exam results are given, by AQE, taking an example, because they'll be the, the latter of, uh, of the, the two, to the point at which uh, then everybody is given absolute clarity about what their offer is. Uh, there are, I think, 15 points in the, the process uh, that, is, that is there. A couple of those are overlapping. 
there are some actions that we've taken to slightly shave a little bit of time off those, but you, it's difficult to compress those by more than, than a couple of weeks. But probably the real, one of the really big problems with this is um, it is very difficult to make any level of compression to the time scales in terms of appeals because people will get a, a final result in terms of where they are um, and then uh, they have a right to put an appeal, they have a period of time to put an appeal and then those appeals have got to be processed and heard. Now, normally that will take a reasonable length of time. It is likely that rather than shorten the process this year, however much that is framed, it is very, very difficult to see a situation in which there will not be considerably more appeals. People will say the circumstances that have led up to this will, will get come. That, that inevitably means that, that a range of these of decisions will not be able to be made until actually the uh, school term begins. It is also the case from the point of view of AQE, and they have particular processes in terms of their examinations. Uh, one of the issues will be, for example, if they were to do January tests, the indications are from them that in terms of a turnaround and getting those results marked, because it's not a simple computer exercise on that basis, would be the middle of March before they could get before they could get the results back. So that again limits anything. You know, we are looking at, but I, I don't want to give people false expectations that there's something that, that that can be done because this is not, you know, the processes are complex. There isn't really, frankly, an awful lot of points where you could have shortcuts within that. Okay, um, just, uh, yeah, thank you, and I won't take up too much more of your time. I would agree that if we don't uh, speak further delay in this, then the, the appeal process will be lengthy. And I think if we were to give all of our uh, pupils the maximum amount of opportunity, we could actually shorten the, uh, and lessen the likelihood of appeal. And just finally on this one, Minister, um, with regard to then the phase and return of pupils and P, the, the incoming P7 cohort, and I've asked you this before, with regard to the centres, um, just uh, would you be supportive again of maybe moving back to primary schools uh, for the setting? I think this is one of the things where we could reduce the risk um, if COVID is still an issue in and around the time scale. And given if we don't get a further delay, it almost certainly will be uh, still a, a topic of conversation. Well, again, again, the venues issue. Um, if I'm picking you up right in terms of uh, in terms of the, the broader picture. The venues issues are, are is ultimately a matter for AQE, PPTC, and the potential hosting schools. There is no bar. Um, there is no bar to uh, tests being held anywhere. Um, now, I, at the moment, I understand, for instance, from the point of view, in terms of AQE, that they use the 34 schools that, that I think uh, are post-primary that use AQE. They then have provision, I think, at the moment for about four centres where they do sort of from degree of overspill. There is absolutely nothing to stop them using, for instance, other primary schools or whatever. The only thing I could see where I could see an argument, if I'm trying to be objective in relation to this, is I suppose if you have some pupils who are sitting an exam in their own primary school, whether that gives them a certain level of advantage um, to pupils who are sitting it not in their own primary school. That, that, that's what you think. But there is, there, is no, there is no bar from the department. There is no legal bar on any location uh, in which that, obviously, apart from that, that would require the, the cooperation. If, for example, AQE was saying, well, actually, we're going to take and help this by putting you know, 30, 40, 50 primary schools to um, assist us with, uh, with in terms of the numbers on this. There's absolutely nothing. That, obviously, that would also require the consent of, of those individual primary schools. Boards of governors have got a, a, a right in, in connection, but there's absolutely no bar that, that comes out. Could also maybe make one point. I think the other thing, which also I think would be useful in terms of easing concerns, you know, I think there needs to be an acknowledgement out of AQE and PPTC that given whatever disruption that has been there, given the unique circumstances and the impact on the curriculum, that has to be some bearing in how they set the test and what they expect of pupils from those tests, because um, th there will be a, a different position in terms of in whatever time frame of the expectation of a pupil this year than would be the case of uh, a pupil in what might be described as a normal year. And I think that that is something I think that, that AQ and PPTC have got to reflect and I think should be, should be making clear. Uh, and I think that that will provide some level of reassurance to people if that is, if that is made. 
Thank you, Minister. Okay, th thanks, Robbie. Uh, is is William still there? No. Okay. Catherine. Yes. Th thank you, Chair, and thank you to you both for making with us the DM today. Um, I have been contacted by a number of substitute teachers who are currently on in a day or two a week when needed in schools that are, that are open and short of teachers. Will these teachers be able to avail of the scheme and can you ensure that substitute teachers who have stepped up in this crisis will not be excluded from the scheme? Well, no, they're, they're not excluded, Catherine. The way it works, like, first of all, any substitute teacher who is in doing work, and whether that's a pre-booking or whether, for example, a school is contacted to say, well, actually, you know, Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so is not able to come in today, we need a substitute teacher in. They will get paid their normal full, full rate for that particular bit of work. Uh, what I suppose in terms of the focus of the scheme is to provide payments for what effectively has been missed out. So I suppose put in crude terms, um, if, if teachers um, normally would have done 25 days uh, during that particular period, but because of the changed circumstances, they're down to maybe doing five days in that bit, it's, it's the extra 20 that they will get the, the payment for. So they will not get excluded from that. I suppose by the same token, they won't effectively get paid twice for the same, the same job, because that, that would actually mean, given the fact there's an 80% payment, uh, it would mean effectively for those five days that they were in, they'd be getting sort of a 1.8 rate type of thing on, on that basis either. So yeah, it, it, they, they will be entirely eligible. Um, I think the only group that, and it's a small percentage, that, uh, because it, it is intended as a form of sort of income support or hardship, Will be we reckon about five percent of of the bit are effectively teachers who have already retired who are getting a specific teacher pension, and they will not be eligible for uh, for the scheme because they are already receiving um, a level. And, and I think you know people will do that to kind of supplement income. And the main focus has got to be particularly on those teachers who are uh, particularly. I suppose this is this is something where it is, is seen for a, a large cadre of people is effectively their main income, maybe their sole income, they're very dependent upon, and that's what the focus has got to be. Yeah, yeah. Th thanks for that um, and for clearing that up. Um, just moving on quickly to, um, in relation to some children with disability um, who have been advised by social workers that a return to school would be beneficial. One issue which has arisen from this is the need for consistency. So children who are returned to school um, need to be attending the same school that they previously did and that they have the same teacher to ensure a smooth transition um, and where children can remain at home. Has there been any discussion around special school classroom assistance being able to support children in their home? I, I, don't, I, I don't think there's been directly uh, support in their home. I don't think there's been any discussion uh, of that, Catherine. Look, I, I think you make a very valid point about having as much consistency as possible. I think uh, there is sometimes um, certain practical difficulties. So, for example, it may well be, for instance, if you get a particular child who's used to a particular teacher, uh, that teacher, for instance, may be somebody who has to shield, for example. Um, I think what we're looking at particularly, I think we're trying to work in terms of the needs of special, obviously there's, there's work ongoing with health directly on, on individual cases to try to provide whatever support can be. I, I think it is also the case that if we are looking at a broader issue about uh, recovery, reopening phase, reopening of schools, yeah. uh, there will be very quite specific thought given to what the particular circumstances of special schools will be, because in some cases those may be very different, even just in terms of practical support, in terms of you know, maybe that there may be different issues around social distancing, maybe around specific PPE, which may be directly needed for special schools, which are not needed uh, within mainstream schools. So all those issues are going to have to be tackled, um, I think, with quite a specific eye on, on special schools. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, okay. thanks for that. I think there definitely does need to be um, a, a separation um, when there, we are planning, um, because there, as you said, there does need to be a particular focus on special schools. And just lastly, here, just a comment. Um, I am very happy to hear that a reference group has been established 
um, which includes officials and child care stakeholders. Um, I think that this is not only a very important development in supporting the sector right now, but also as we move forward and begin to plan post-pandemic. Um, Thank you. I, I, I know, Catherine, no, I'm just, I'm just going to say, obviously, particularly as regards to the child care sector, while there will be various, um, for instance, contained, I know that some people have raised this, in terms of the wider executive piece on facing, I know people have raised some of the things. I think it's because we will need to also take a look very specifically at the child care sector, so I didn't really want to want to better, uh, lump them in just with the, the, the broader issues with regards to schools, because there will be separate issues that will be faced with that. And we'll need to find clear cut solutions as we move ahead to the child care sector. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Justin McNulty. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Peter, and thank you, Dirk, for your time and for your forthrightness as always. Um, I want to applaud uh, the Minister and the Permanent Secretary on eventually coming up with, with come forward with a package for the substitute teachers with twelve hundred applicants in less than twenty four hours demonstrates the desire and the need of the out there. So well done in making that happen. Um, I want to go back on to the transfer test. I know Robbie mentioned inequality, and Derek, you mentioned Section 75, how that isn't applicable, and I see that. Um, however, the reality is some parents have been incredibly diligent and proactive and uh, home teaching their, their kids, and they're ready to go. They're ready to rock for the 11 plus or for the transfer, transfer test to take place at the scheduled time or two weeks delayed. But the reality is all parents don't have that luxury. So, you know, a lot of parents are under extreme duress now through their whatever career uh, they might find themselves in. Their children are not getting the, the homeschooling opportunities that they might otherwise have gotten if this crisis had not happened. So I feel it's, it's not acceptable to move back by two weeks only. It's going to disadvantage too many children. There are too many unpolished diamonds of kids who are not going to get the educational opportunity that they might otherwise have gotten by this exam not being pushed back further. I think it has to give them serious consideration for how, how things can be squeezed the other end to facilitate the delay, to allow every child to get the best opportunity they can to, to shine in this exam, or you know, whatever configuration of exams that may take place to allow this to be a solution that allows every child to get the best opportunity possible. And I think that needs to be given really, really serious consideration. Oh, oh, okay, look, Justin, I... I as indicated, I think we will, we, we have looked, we've had discussions with the EA, we will continue to look and look very closely at that. I'm just making a more general point that in terms of time frames, it is very difficult to create the level of headroom that is there in terms of the time frames, um, because they can't, if, if there is a pushback, you don't, you don't start getting even the results until the middle of March. So that, that, that's the point at which the clock starts ticking. It is very difficult to, to truncate that. And it, it, it seems to me that irrespective of a, of a time frame, it will be very difficult to circumscribe um, how peas can be in terms of timing and that. And I think one of the things that also needs to be taken into consideration in terms of any changes within that, if there is any level of um, artificial removal of, of, of time frames to truncate them in such a way, we also got to realise that that will also be subject to whatever level of legal challenge comes there. So what, what needs to be done has got to be lost. But look, I, look, I take on board what you said. We will, we will look closely at that. You know, I, I think we can try and, again, there is a broader level, which with, as with anything, we can try and compensate where possible for broader inequalities within society. Will those ever be entirely overcome? No, I, I think it's difficult to find any system which entirely... People will always try to use their personal circumstances at times for certain levels of advantage. And that, unfortunately, is a certain level of fact of life, to be honest on it. But I appreciate the point that you've made. Okay, thanks, Derek. And the last thing is just on child care. Um, obviously, we, we know that child care, the child care sector is going to play an incredibly important role in rebooting society in general. How, how, how is that going to impact in terms of teachers? Or, I mentioned this with the unions earlier. How is child care and uh, availability of child care, child care going to impact on teachers' the capability of returning to teaching environment in schools, within the schools, given that many teachers may have partners who are teachers also yes. and who may not have access to child care? Well, yeah, but don't forget, Justin, in terms of the provision that is there and indeed as part of the scheme, the focus of the child care 
scheme that has gone through, and indeed similarly, I suppose, for, um, for the situation of children being at school, the focus as well as vulnerable children has been on uh, children of key workers. Teachers are key workers. They've been clearly um, defined as such. Uh, I think they're still. I think they're probably even defined as such within the health side of it, but certainly will be anyway. So yeah. So they are absolutely key workers. And it would, look, I think you're right in terms of things would be utterly counterproductive if we are saying we need, uh, as we move ahead, um, a level of reopening of schools, a, a phase point of view. But if we were then placing barriers effectively in teachers being at work because they couldn't get faces for the, their children, so yeah, they, they are absolutely clear cut that that provision has been made and will continue to be made for, for teachers. Okay. Thanks, okay. Justin. Thanks. Thank, thanks, Justin. Thanks, Minister. Thanks, Permanent Secretary. Time has beaten us this morning. I understand, Minister, you're giving a statement to the Ad Hoc Committee tomorrow as well, so we, we look forward to engaging with you on that. Okay, thank you, sir. Thanks very much indeed. Okay, members, um, we just have time to take our oral briefing from the Department of Education on continuity of learning. I refer members to briefing paper at page 154 from Committee Clark and a briefing paper from the Department of Education on the Curriculum Qualifications and Standards Directorate program at page 156. Can I welcome Mrs. Faustina Graham, Director of Curriculum Qualifications and Standards in the Department of Education, Mrs. Karen McCulloch, Head of School Improvement Team, Mr. Raymond Caldwell, Acting Chief Inspector of the Education and Training Inspectorate, and hopefully as well, Ms. Michelle Corky, Director of Education at the Education Authority. Can I invite officials to brief the committee with opening remarks? Um, and we may have to return at a later date for questions, but you're very welcome, officials. Okay, thank you, Chair. And um, I'm Fustida Graham from the Department. I'm Director for Curriculum, Qualifications and Standards. And just to confirm that all of the other colleagues you mentioned are on the call also this morning. Thank you. Um, so, the department forwarded a briefing paper to the committee on the director contingency program, and that paper will form the basis of this opening statement. The curriculum qualifications and standards directorate has responsibility for policies in all of those associated areas. However, the policies are then delivered and implemented by our arm's length bodies and our schools. So before I outline the program to the committee, I do want to take this opportunity to applaud the work of our teachers and all of our support services and arm's length bodies in responding at pace, creatively and collaboratively to our current set of circumstances. Prior to the lockdown, the committee had scheduled a briefing for my directorate to come and talk to you about school improvement and effective curriculum implementation including the use of ICT. A feature of those briefings would have been the ongoing opportunities and challenges facing our system in relation to educational standards and school improvement, when, as an education system, we have been somewhat at odds with each other over the last three years. By contrast, it has been crystal clear in recent weeks that despite any differences, Education professionals, in the range of roles they undertake, have at no point lost sight of the centrality of children and young people in everything that we do. That common purpose, which unites all who work in education, now provides us and DE with an opportunity, even in these difficult circumstances, to begin to restore what had been really effective relationships and trust with all of our teachers. We see this program of work as a key vehicle for doing precisely that. The program board and the work stream is representatives from all of our support and arm's length bodies, and we are working collaboratively on one program. The work comprises two key strands. Firstly, the delivery of qualifications, and secondly, implementation of the curriculum through distance learning, insofar as that is possible. Central to the delivery of both is the efficiency and effectiveness of our educational technology services, and those are commonly referred to as C2K. Unlike any other UK jurisdiction, we have in place a technology infrastructure 
which supports effective practice in online learning. C2K delivers a comprehensive range of tools to support learning. And I would point out to the committee that the system is not designed for what it is doing now, but it has stood the test and pressure of recent weeks, and for many schools and learners, underpins their strategic approach to distance learning. My colleague, Justin Edwards, the Chief Executive of CCEA, provided an oral briefing to the committee on the qualifications element of the program. Therefore, my focus will be on supporting distance learning. The core objective of the distance learning element is to support and secure, as far as possible, the continued learning of all people at home and in school during the current pandemic and beyond. The major strategy for achieving this is and will be the production and dissemination of high quality support and guidance for teachers, parents and learners. I would stress though that distance learning does not involve just online learning alone. It would be inappropriate for children and young people to sit in front of a computer screen all day. So effective planning on the part of our schools involves a combination and range of approaches to learning as it always does, whatever the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Good schools are continuing to function as good schools, despite the complexity of the demand. The project then has two key elements of delivery. One is that every school has an allocated link officer from one of the support services, and that person will work to make connections with relevant personnel in schools and beyond, providing accurate and consistent information from one central source, and hopefully alleviating concerns at individual school level. In that spirit of working collaboratively, for example, CCA colleagues worked with the range of link officers from other organizations recently to upskill those officers to support both SIA and schools in working through the different, the current, sorry, qualifications process. There is no requirement for schools to use the link officers, but that offer of ongoing support is there. The second element is a number of, again, cross-organizational working groups targeted at the various phases of education. These groups of sector specialists have been initially engaged in the collation of baseline information, which has been used to identify, for example, high quality resources that are already available and to redesign or repurpose those resources where it's relevant, to identify areas of need and concern which require development of additional guidance materials, and finally, examples of practice and resources which are working well and which can be disseminated in the future. The outputs to date are listed in your briefing paper. Working in this context, we are now looking more strategically at how to support the system in the medium and the longer term. Building on what exists and exploring best practice in blended learning approaches. There are six key areas of our work that we're exploring and these will include increased access to teacher professional learning courses focused on effective planning for blended learning, the production of case studies and quality indicators that will support schools in areas they have identified as challenging, such as sustaining pupil engagement and motivation, assessment of learning, feedback to both pupils and parents, and measuring and monitoring the impact of the different approaches they are taking. Moving on then, we also want to support parents to stay involved in practical and manageable ways as we enter a period where blended learning will be a key feature. We want to establish new approaches to evaluating collaboratively the impact of any loss of learning. We want to adapt and modify the curriculum and qualifications to minimize impact on standards. And finally, we want to explore approaches 
to support children and young people who have not had sufficient support over the period of the pandemic. So in closing, I hope that the papers and opening statements provide some insight and assurance about the steps that the department and our delivery partners are taking to support schools, parents, and pupils to continue to secure high standards. As I said earlier, all of the work is underpinned by a commitment to collaborative practice and to the avoidance of duplication. We would not claim the program is perfect. There are many points of learning for us all, and we are completely open to learning those lessons. Any one of our colleagues here this morning can elaborate further on any element of the programme I've referred to. And we welcome the committee's comments, questions and suggestions as we continue to work to identify and address emerging issues and challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Faustina. Um, that's a really helpful um, detailed and efficient briefing on the work you're doing uh, to maintain continuity of learning. Uh, I'm extremely sorry, but our timings uh, prevent us from discussing this with you and asking questions of you today. Um, would it be possible for us to invite you um, back to another session, possibly next week, in order to discuss the written and oral briefing um, that you've provided to us? Absolutely, we'd be more than happy to do that, Chair. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, uh, and in terms of the, the two key issues I, I think that members have raised is the, the extent to which pupils are experiencing distance learning, notwithstanding the um, dedicated efforts of our teachers um, differently or inequitably. Um, perhaps when we return, you could um, give us some assessment of that extent to which pupils are experiencing diff distance learning um, differently or inequitably. And, and another suggestion that was made in our, our previous session today was that the inspection and improvement process could have a particular focus on inspecting and supporting pedagogies for, for that blended school and distance learning approach that is um, foreseeable uh, for, the, for the next uh, while. Uh, if those are two things that you, we, we could maybe raise with you at a, at a future session, if that's agreeable. Are members agreeable to that approach as well? Agreed. Agreed? Okay. Agreed. Okay, officials, thank you very much indeed, for, as I say, for the, the detailed and efficient written and oral briefing. Um, continuity of learning is a key issue for education going forward, and we, we look forward to re-engaging with you on that, uh, hopefully next week. Okay, thank you, Chair. I'm very happy to take forward those two areas that you've identified. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, um, we have a... Yeah? Can I offer an apology to you and the other members? Uh, I've got to now go to the... Uh, communities committee, so I'll, I'll buy out at this. No, stage. no problem. We're just going to okay. wrap up ourselves. Thanks, Robin. Thank you. Okay, Clark. Um, is there are there any outstanding items you need to speak to before we bring the meeting to a close? Uh, so, Chair, just in terms of the briefings we've had today, I think we're writing to DE just about the two things you said there. I think maybe we're also writing to the department just about Catherine's point about uh, special school classroom assistance and providing support in the home. That wasn't something I'd heard about before. And then maybe we're also writing to the NITC, asking them for a paper about the resources and costs that they think will be needed for the sort of COVID uh, lockdown um, relaxation. Support programme, yeah. yeah support okay. Program and you're content with actions agreed from chairperson's business earlier as well then, Clark? Yes, chair. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, do we need to attempt correspondence or forward work program or you can, can, can we? <laughs> yes. Okay. Go ahead, Clark. So uh, just in terms of the correspondence, the if members are content with the index, um, there's just one or two other things. The Youth Work Alliance, uh, written to us at page 200, they're asking about delays to the new funding scheme for youth groups. Remember, members took a briefing about this ages ago. Um, just a member's content to write to the EA and just seek clarity about this, because I'm not clear on whether it's... I thought this was going to be phased. Is that what they're talking about? Or is this some other delay? And I just would think maybe the committee might um, value clarity, if that's agreed, Chairperson. Agreed. 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 And the other one then was 202, 
Um, this was a lot of very useful information, page 202 from the Committee for Finance, all about in-year monitoring round, um, so that I presume members will be content to ask the department for a short briefing on the June monitoring round. Usually it's not that interesting, but this year it will be interesting because there'll be COVID things, I would have thought, in the air. And additionally, there's a further vote on accounts supply resolution debate on the 26th of May. So this is because of the COVID situation. The department, as Permsec indicated a few weeks ago, is one of those departments that is, inverted commas, due to run out of money. Um, so they need a new vote on account to, just to keep everything right. So hopefully, Chairperson, the committee will agree that it's content for the chair to speak in that debate and indicate uh, you know, its support for things like, uh, and welcoming things like the substitute teacher funds, and um, perhaps just reiterating a lot of the points that they, they made previously. On this yeah. that, that's agreed. Agreed. Agreed, thanks. And that's that on that. I'm going to move the forward work programme. Okay, uh, forward work programme, Clerk. So, Chairperson, if members turn to uh, page, hold on, I do it myself. Uh, we're at page 298 of your meeting packs. Uh, so, I think. Next week, um, we won't have Starleaf, I don't think. I think it will still be the teleconference. Sorry about that. So the suggestion is that we start at nine, uh, then squeeze in the briefing from the officials that we didn't have time for just there. Plus, we'll have the teleconference on um, preschool admissions, and then we'll have our usual departmental update. So if members are happy to do that, uh, and I presume members, if members will confirm that in terms of the... 3rd of June and the 10th of June, where we're talking about a briefing on, um, sorry, uh, sorry, I am has got that wrong, sorry, in terms of the 10th of June and the 17th of June, where we're talking about briefings about SEND statementing, I guess members are content to do those, provided we have Starleaf, and if we don't, then maybe we'll delay that until we do, if that's agreed, Chairperson? Yep, agreed. Can I, sorry, can yeah. I just suggest as well, in terms of our, our correspondence to select schools asking regards contingency plan? Are members content to make clear an invitation to any selective school that wishes to um, uh, brief the committee um, in an evidence session is more than welcome to do so? Are members content? Yeah. Agreed? Yep. Okay. okay. Thanks. So um, are members content, um, as Clark has said, with uh, Children's Commissioner on 10th of June uh, on saying and the Education Authority on saying on the 17th of June? Um, Starleaf permitting. Agreed? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just come on, um, suppose it just today shows second three briefing. It's yeah. just not feasible at all. Um, so yeah. I no, think that, we do need to stick with the two. That's, um, that's fair. Yeah, a, a lesson learned today that we, we have to discipline ourselves to two evidence sessions only and um, my apologies that um, that did squeeze us all today. We'll we'll rectify that further to today. So, Chairperson, what will we do next week? Because we're now planning three for next week. Is it is it two plus questions to officials? Uh, so it would be what we just had. Yep. Um, what we didn't have. Yep. Plus, um, the department wants to brief about preschool admissions, and then we would have our usual um, D briefing. Now, I wasn't expecting the minister to dial in this week. Was no. One of the reasons it was a bit longer. Are, are members content that we make next week our, our last week of, of anything more than two evidence sessions with a, a brief uh, question uh, session with the officials from that we had to reschedule further to today? Yeah, okay. we'll, we'll do that. Okay. So, um, Chairperson, members are content just to go to closed session for a minute? Yep, yeah, agreed. Agreed? Yep. Okay. Okay. Twenty nine. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room twenty nine. This is the Northern